Great, great. Uh, all right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this one-off stream. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, modern mon modern monetary theory yet again, MMT. I am responding to my long-term nemesis, Lord Keynes II, who wrote a blog post in his usual charming charming manner, uh, as, we're, as we're about to see. Um, and I'm joined by uh, two of my good buddies here, Radical Liberation. How are you doing, Howdy. sir? Hi, doing well. And um, what, what should I call you? Restitor Orbis or Jack? Just call me Jack. It's easier. Restitutor Orbis is a bit of a mouthful. Now, now before we before we get into this, because we're going to be getting into the weeds of Lord right. Keynes's um, Lord Keynes's post, and uh, I've even gone and found like price data from the early seventies to give him a proper rebuttal here. Um, but uh, before we get into it, I wanted to uh, mention a couple of things. Earlier on today, I wanted to make a video about um, the new schedule on my channel. Um, mm. And I haven't been able to uh, get around to this, so I might as well get a notepad and pen. Okay, the, the new schedule on my channel is this: every Sunday and Wednesday at nine a.m., you'll get the Econ Shots videos. Right. Um, they're, they're these little short Econ bursts that I'm doing at the moment. Literally, literally um, like literally like five minutes or so. It seems. Yeah, little little, little yeah. kind of four or five minute vignettes. Uh, right. And they kind of have a slight historical bent, you know. So the one today was about uh, the, um, the salt, uh, you know, the salt case from 1948, uh, one of the most absurd antitrust cases in history, um, basically. Um, so, so every night, every Sunday and Wednesday at 9 a.m., um, those econ shots will be out, and then every Tuesday at 9 p.m., unpopular opinions airs, and every Friday at 9 p.m is the scar stream and then if that's the basic structure any other videos that come out and i will be making other videos longer ones just come out as and when but if um a lot of people are saying they don't always get notifications these days but if you have those times in mind you know when to check the channel basically for for, for new stuff so um, sailor asked for the time zone on everything you said and that would be british summer time yeah i mean yeah i mean greenwich yeah, yeah. Uh, it's london the, the center of time i don't care about any of the time zones <laughs> uh, so uh, but, but yeah I, I whenever i say times i mean london time okay um so you have to work out the calculations you're, you're all adults you can do that you've got google uh the other thing i wanted to do um before we got going is um and i wanted to I'm, i still might make this separate video just on the schedule is i actually wanted to plug the two channels of my uh friends here so radlib you've got a channel where you do a regular deep econ stream called right. uh deep, what's it called called deep lore, deep lore econ chat named yeah. after uh, a community some of us uh love um and uh I, I uh, do it with Mad Mercenary, who I met through the Deep Lore, and we get a lot of participation from folks in the Deep Lore. So it's a little bit inside baseball in that sense, but I think the topics we've covered have been of wider interest. Yeah, do you want to give us a flavor of some of the stuff you've been looking at recently? Right. Well, one of the earlier ones that I, I love to mention just because it seemed to be more popular was, uh, does the free market lead to degeneracy? because that comes up a lot. But you know, more recently, I've been trying to be a little bit topical. So we, we like to hit the literature. We like to pick out an article maybe um, and uh, go through it, but something that's relevant. So uh, we talked about the 1920-21 downturn and the rather rapid recovery from it. It was a downturn worse than the 1929-1931. And it yeah. recovered quite rapidly in the United States and nobody knows about it. And so I thought that would be interesting in the light of, uh, I'm afraid, a recovery or lack of it that we face soon in 2020. Um, and then in the course of this, Mad Mercenary uh, tells us about this amazing fellow, the 10th Prime Minister of Australia, who um, was totally based. And not only did he get Australia out of the depression, and they had a terrible 32% unemployment, not, not only did he get them out of it, but they had like a, a little industrial revolution or something. They like, you know, went from 80% farmers to you know, 50% uh, farmers in the course of like, while everyone else was going through a depression, Australia was going through an e economic burst, you know? Anyway, so that gives you a little flavor. That was our, our stream just a couple days ago. We do it every other week. 
Yeah, and I, I always have fun with that uh, 1921 recovery because yeah. whenever anyone asks me who my favorite president is, <laughs> I I will always say Warren G. Harding. <laughs> yes, yeah, he's great. <laughs> but um, I, there, there's more to say on that. I don't know if you got into it, but um, one of Milton Friedman's big uh, claims is that they got through that and the recovery was as good as it was because of printing money. And um, oh. I would, I would just, I dissent from that opinion a yeah. little bit, as as yeah, does Murray. It's, it's factually, Murray it, it's literally factually incorrect. I think. Yeah, I mean, did you get into that on that stream? I, um, I haven't. Uh, no, I did not uh, deal with Friedman's interpretation. We did not because because one of the, one of the issues from the Austrian point, from the Musesian point of view, uh, and certainly the Murray Rothbard's um, stuff on the Great Depression is all about this, was actually how. Um, the, the the printing of money to get through a recession okay um uh causes an inf an, an inflationary boom and then the bust is even worse so he sees the wall street crash as it kind of just another boom bust cycle if you want it's the yep. bust following the boom of uh you know when they printed lots of money in the mid-20s um, right, and, and, and let me jump in here because I think this yeah. may be relevant to current events. I, I think the giveaway of the mindset here, and I'm not talking about a specific school of economics, but just sort of the where the mainstream understanding of these things, is that whenever a bubble gets going, a boom gets going, you start seeing these articles and books coming out saying that it'll never end. You know, yeah. we, we can keep this going forever. That is, they don't seem to understand what Austrians understand, that there's an artificiality to the boom. And they really do think that you can just, you know, keep pumping the money, keep the party going forever, and never face the consequences. And yeah. they, and we always do. But they, every time they, they come back round to that same. Oh, right. thing, it's the know? term bubble. Say it's it in the name. It's in the term bubble. Right. right. Yeah, and and I mean this is what, this is one of the things that happened in two thousand eight, famously, where um where you had the likes of Milton Friedman and the Chicago guys actually mm -hmm. denying that there was a problem. Oh, everything's fine. <laughs> Right, you know, right. it, it, until until there was li until it was literally doomsday, m most of them were still like true believers. Oh, there'll never be a recession again. You know, we've got it all under control. We're we've got our finger on the lever of the Fed and all this sort of stuff. So, right, right, right. So, so Mark Thornton, the the great guy at uh, the Mises Institute, mm -hmm. um, did the skyscraper curse, where he talks about. I, I was waiting for somebody to finally do this, where he said, "Hey, look." Austrians keep being right about this stuff, you know, and Austrians have tended to downplay that because we don't believe in prophecy exactly, right? But nevertheless, a better analysis yields you better results. Uh, and we keep seeing that with the Austrians. Well, you could do a flip side book, right? Where you could talk about Irving Fisher in 1929, where he's saying that uh, there's no problem here. <laughs> uh, Milton Friedman in 2008, and on and on and on. You could come up with all of the people who keep getting it wrong. Right, yeah, or, before, or um, right or, before or the, it falls apart. The Keynesians know? in the seventies, and my my absolute right. favorite example is uh, is Samuelson. Yeah. You know, oh, by uh, by you know, by nineteen eighty four, the USSR will have overtaken the USA as a, as the world's biggest economy, and then he revises it to nineteen ninety seven, and then he revises it again to two thousand and one to two thousand and one, and then it um, collapses on him, and, and, then, and then it collapses. So, but I mean, it's it's just. A, you know these things should be embarrassing, but they they don't seem to matter. Yeah. You know the the scale of getting it wrong uh, in that way. What about what about Paul Krugman? The internet's just a blip. Do you remember the, <laughs> the internet? You know, no, everybody will look back and wonder what that was all about. But yeah. but anyway, yeah. Anyway, um, anyway uh, we're you're going to talk, about, you're gonna talk about Jack's channel. Yeah. I want to, yes, I do also want to introduce people to Jack. So everybody should go now and subscribe to Radlib. And I hope the people who are really into econ, they, I, I would say Radlib and Mad Merck get into more detail than I tend to on my channel. You know, a lot of my videos, I've always got the, the lay person in mind a lot of the time. So we, do, I don't tend to really get down into the weeds much. I think you'd agree with that, Radlib. I, I try to keep it kind of like almost the person coming in doesn't know anything about econ all the time, you know, yeah, or they know a little bit, you know, um, whereas you guys are able to really get into it. Um, so if you're really into your econ, I'd, I, I'd subscribe to, to Radlib, but that also goes for Jack, uh, whose channel is also pretty in depth. Why didn't you uh, tell us a bit about your channel, Jack? It, 
Is he there? Jack, we can't hear you. You're on mute. I don't know where he's gone. Oh no! All right, this was his this was his big opportunity to show his channel. <laughs> well, anyway, if, uh, if you're into um, if you're into it, uh, I would also give him uh, give him a, a subscribe as well. Um, they recently were looking at uh, I'm trying to remember what what he was looking at on his channel, but it was pretty good. It was. Um, uh, um, you're probably thinking of the negative oil prices. Explain. Yes, the negative oil prices, which was something that. Right. Um, Jack, you're back, you're back, right? Oh, he's gone. Well, anyway, let me show for Jack. Um, I'm actually in the industry, which uh, AA was as well a uh, long time ago, briefly. Um, and uh, I hope that's okay to say. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, and I have to admit, I my real life was being affected by negative oil futures. You know, my work life. Um, and I was like, wait, how can the price be negative. So <laughs> I actually benefited from watching his video because I was not getting it. I'm, I mean, I'm seeing the effects of it in, in my my work life, but I don't know how it's possible for there to be negative oil futures. So it's it's his uh, four days ago video, negative oil prices explained. If you're also wondering what in the world is going on with a negative price, how is that even possible? Uh, it's worth uh, giving it a watch. It's just 10 minutes. Great, yeah, and uh, I mean, hopefully, he'll come back at some point. Um, all right, so uh, anything else we want to mention before we get going? I think, uh, well, actually, I wouldn't mind if you'd help me a little bit because I, I've got this uh, funny thing like uh, Hayek talked about the same thing. If things don't make sense to me, I have difficulty remembering them, <laughs> and so modern monetary theory it's it's basically like we owe it to ourselves, so we might as well just go crazy. Is that a reasonable summary, or am I missing something? Uh, um, <laughs> I'm just yeah. talking elevator pitch for modern. modern, modern. Uh, they've got this. They've got this idea that um, the uh, so if you imagine um, government spending, okay, being like a push and pull lever with private saving so they've got this idea that government spending is correlated with private spending so and they, wait so the they, more they spend the more people save the more the government spends the more private people save yes that okay that way okay right and they and they do they do this through a, a complicated uh well it's not that complicated but they do a bit of algebra around the gdp okay. around the gdp um formula yeah uh, which you, you you walk through in your video right which i walk through in the video and that and that's how they get come to this conclusion that um the more you can finance uh kind of government projects through deficit spending the more people in the real economy can save and therefore they lead that into investment you mean yeah and and oh, they're yeah. actually and, and one of the quirks of it is that they're not financing it through taxation. They're doing it through deficit spending. Mm. Which is no problem because we owe it to ourselves. That's where that part comes in, right? So, something like, well, something like this, but you see, the idea of doing it through taxation wouldn't work because that's me basically holding a gun to um, your head, uh, taking your money, right? And then, and then giving some of it back to you in order to, in order to save. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, in the in the in the way that they do it, they're actually just getting the money from the Fed. Essentially, new money. It's all new money. It's all mm -hmm. and 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 then I didn't really get into this in the video, but they've got this kind of quirky thing where um, money can also be destroyed as well. It uh, like ta in their in their way of thinking, taxation is just money destroyed. Okay. Rather than, so, so when when the government spend money, they create it, and when the government tax money, they destroy it. <laughs> in the in the in the MMT way of thinking. Okay, okay, but but to bottom line it then, if you need to help the economy to grow, the government yeah. should spend, which will cause people to save, and therefore there'll be money savings for investment, and therefore the economy will grow, and therefore government spending equals economic growth. <laughs> Am yeah, I oversimplifying? Yeah. Um, there's there's another thing to it as well though because in mm. the, they define savings 
as savings minus investment. So we're not taking the investments into account. We're taking the investments out. This is just people saving for a rainy day. Okay. Not for invest. It's just savings, pure savings. Does that make which, sense? Which they want. They want people to save. I thought usually Keynesians didn't like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's. Uh, I, I mean. Well, it, feel free to jump in, Jack. No, 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 Jack. We were in the middle of shilling your channel, but you disappeared at that precise moment. So, do you want to say a little thing about your channel before we go on? Can I just double check you guys? Can you hear me? No, you're you're very fuzzy. It's kind of roboty. Yeah. Okay. Um, something else happened. Now my headphones are playing up. You guys sound really funny to me. And yeah, you, you are. Uh, we, so, we, we we can't hear you, Jack. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm going to completely restart. Okay. We 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 can't oh. really understand anything you're saying, so you, you might as well reboot or something and try to come back. All right. I'll type in the all right yeah so, so sorry, where were we so so um they do mmtiers want to encourage saving yeah yeah so so the idea okay. is, is that is that more people can save if you if you go about it this way um okay. they also have this idea that and this is where i came back to keynes's theory of idle resources even though they don't call it that They've got this idea that if you've got loads of people who are unemployed or sitting around doing nothing, um, there are lots of resources going unused. They're not utilized. Um, and this is an inefficient allocation of resources. So you might as what well, is better for the government to spend money and come up with projects, you know, like I said, digging ditches, building bridges, you know, the usual Keynesian stuff. Um, and if uh, they did that, funded through deficit spending not through taxation um that would lead in time to full employment and to uh kind of you know hunt completely efficient allocation of resources across the economy and solve all our problems etc cetera, etc cetera. Hmm. so okay. uh yeah so, so into the article yeah should we uh should we make a start okay so Let's uh, let us start with um, with. I mean, is there, is there anything else that you'd add? I, I just want to do a dramatic reading of the first sentence of the article, if you'll allow me to be Lord Keynes too, for just a moment. <laughs> All right. Academic agent, a YouTube libertarian, and unusually ignorant advocate of Austrian economics, tries to refute modern monetary theory in this video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, yeah, an unusually ignorant advocate of Austrian economics tries to, and he, you know, he always starts his refutations in that manner. So, um, well, to be fair, you on Twitter at least, you you tend to uh, uh, be like that. Now, I don't know that you would do that in a footnoted article, you know. <laughs> I, I, to be honest, he calls me names a lot more than I call him names. Oh, really? I didn't you know, keep track. You know, I've, after he's called me a moron 20 times, I, you know, <laughs> maybe then I'll be like, uh, you know, after you've been called a clown 50 times and a moron 20 times, it's, uh, you know, sometimes you might fire back once in a while. Right, but, right. Uh, anyway, let's, let's, he says, let's run through this video, refute academic agents' arguments point by point, okay? He says, academic agent fails to refute the three core principles of MMT. There are three fundamental principles of modern monetary theory as follows. Number one, most sovereign governments today are the monopoly issuers of their own fiat currencies since the gold standard has been abolished. Okay, now, do you have any problems with that? I, I, I guess I no. agree. I, I, no one else no, is I, issuing the I mean, fiat currencies, right? Yeah, no. Nobody disagrees with this. Yeah, okay? yeah, we're all we're all on board on number one. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, number two. Now, the reason he's mentioning it, the reason he's putting that up front, okay, is mm. because in my video I said before we even get to modern monetary theory, there are two other key areas of disagreement. If you remember, right. mm -hmm. one is on the origin of money, and then and also related to that, the nature of money. What is money? Okay, which we would define as commodity money, basically as emerging to um, solve the problem of the double coincidence of wants. Mm -hmm. You know, if we're, if, we're, if we're in an economy, I want to trade uh, fish and you want to give me eggs, okay? What if, um, what if uh, 
you don't want fish. Now I'm stuck. Now I need to find somebody to buy my fish, right? right. So, you know, now I, I need to find someone who just so happens to have eggs who wants fish. So to get around this problem, uh, you know, you find a medium of exchange. Right. And so... And, money... and, and, and conversely, uh, alternatively, they have this notion that money... Uh, you know, you're on the, you're all on the island, and there's more and more of you, and then eventually somebody declares themselves to be the state, and only yeah. then they introduce money so that they can tax it, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, yeah, and the name, uh, and so money is basically a, f a function of law and taxation, right? And the, the the name for that way of thinking about money is chartalism. They were oh, they okay. were around they were around in the 19th century, and if you read um, mm. if you read Mises's uh, book uh the theory of money and credit he talks about them in there as mm -hmm. does hayek and you know hayek writes loads of stuff he's got a bit on the chart list somewhere in his you know 1920s essays that i've got here somewhere right. so um yeah uh so if you if you have a look in the history of these debates these are all things that were kind of as ever with keynesians it's stuff that was dealt with long ago that yeah. has come back. They want to bring it back for some reason, you know. Right. Um, so they're they're basically reviving this charterist way of, of viewing money uh, as against the the commodity so, view of okay, money. Okay. So in that view, then number one is interesting. He's being very lawyerly here, right? Because he's not arguing about the origin of money, though we'll get into that later. But he's saying all you have to accept is that however we got here governments are the ones who are issuing the money now yeah yes. right that's but, what he's doing that's the maneuver here so so basically he's saying listen all this stuff about chartalism it doesn't matter let's yeah. move beyond that you didn't need right. that bit is what he's saying yeah and i'm i'm saying actually you do need that because it fundamentally mm -hmm. affects what you mean by money okay mm -hmm. now there's there's a little bit i left out of the video that i could have got into but i didn't okay and that was um uh, Mises is regression theorem. Okay, this is the right, little which bit... he's going to attack that later on, right? Yeah. Now, now, th now, this bit on the regression theorem um, is something that Austrians have that a lot of other economists, uh, th like the Chicago guys, do. I don't believe they have the regression theorem part. Mm -hmm. um, and this is basically Mises saying that, um, okay, so at some point in history, commodity money emerges, sometime in the distant past. And whatever money we have now, if you if you regress, if you keep on going back, you end up there somewhere. Right. Even even though it may be many kind of moves, many kind of stages removed from that. So, right. um, for example, after commodity money, you, you could get paper money, or you could get credit money, or you could get um, now we've got fiat money. Okay. But the dollar that we that you exchange today, that fiat dollar. You recognize it as currency because it has replaced something that was once uh, a piece of paper representing gold. And you accepted that piece of paper because once it was actual gold, right? So that's the regression theorem in a nutshell. Right. And then Douglas Adams has a fun uh, way of coming at this. I don't know how much he was in economics, but in, in uh, one of the Hitchhiker's Guidebooks, uh, they land on Earth and they declare that the leaves are money, you know, not, not based on a, a process of you know, something, the leaves represent something which was once gold or something like that. They just say the leaves are money. And then everybody's just piling leaves around themselves, you know. And um, it's funny and it's absurd because that's exactly what the Austrians are saying can't happen. You yeah. can't just, 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 just from the sky, just say, this is now money. And everyone goes, oh, sure, I'll just start using it. It just literally, it wouldn't work. Yeah, you've got to piggyback on uh, some existing... So, some existing commodity money is what Mises is saying. J Jack, can we hear you now? Uh, can you hear yes. me? Yes, you sound yes. good. Okay. Yes, you can yeah, sound good. I, everyone on the Discord was saying it was my connection, but I'm on 4G, so I'm sure it was my mic. But I found it rather amusing. Someone on the Discord said uh, it was Lord Keynes who was behind this. He was trying to prevent us from being able to debunk his work. Right. Um, <laughs> Right. So we're, anyway. we're, we're on point one. <laughs> one, one. Yeah. So we wanted, to, we wanted to uh, plug your channel, which I think we've, oh, we've yeah. basically done. But is there anything else you wanted to mention mm -hmm. about your channel uh, while, while, while we're still early on? Uh, well, uh, every Monday I do pub quiz and policy, which is a stream where basically 
Um, the poll, it, it's in the name. We do a pub quiz, but each round is separated by a discussion about some sort of policy issue from the last week. Um, we didn't do it this week because we had a debate on the ideal form of government, but it will be back tomorrow. And aside from that, it's just um, basic econ videos I'm, I'm uploading. Um, I think you mentioned I, I have my negative oil prices video. Yeah, um, yeah. It's one of my most recent ones. I also had a, a taxation is theft video, which got blocked by YouTube, but they unblocked it yesterday. So <laughs> that's up as well. Um, and my next one will be on bond yields. I had a vote on my Twitter um, between whether people wanted me to do a video on monopolies or bond yields, and they voted for bond yields. So that will be this week, uh, mm -hmm. this upcoming week. And the week after, I'll do the monopoly one. All but, right. Yeah, if you want to subscribe, then there's a link in AA's video description. So, so we've just been talking through um, very quickly what MMT is. I don't know if you how much of that you caught, but is mm -hmm. there anything else you'd add to what we've said so far about what it, what it is? You know, uh, I didn't, I didn't catch much of it. I, I caught you being curious about the savings part, and mm. obviously your con your confusion comes down to the macro formula, which is that somehow you can uh, have increased savings if you increase the money supply, but this obviously isn't true because we know that if you increase the money supply, then it lowers interest rates and lower interest rates reduce savings because there's more, in, there's obviously less incentive yeah. to save in banks, literally. Um, yeah, so so no, you, you don't get increased savings. Uh, my, my you know, my de-technalized version of that in the video was just like, I, I thought it would be easier for people to picture if I just had like granny. That's why I had the granny in the video, yeah. you know, uh, trying to, trying to say yeah, under a yeah. bed or something. But essentially what you're doing is yeah. you're you're nailing that you're basically devaluing that person's savings through inflation, which we'll get onto in a second. But you're also you're also mm. you're also putting her in a position where you're actually trying to push they're actually pushing her. To, she has to do something with her money to stop it losing value. I mean, that's the situation that we're all used to now, with very low interest rates, very difficult to get in to get um interest on your actual savings so you're actually having to do like stupid things like for example trying to buy 40 barrels of oil and losing a shitload of money like i did last week well right <laughs> yeah well, the, the low interest rates are a big part of it because it's obviously links to and we won't go into it because i'd imagine this something want to add afterwards but the austrian business cycle theory um because low interest rates reduce savings increase malinvestment um, but also another interesting one, which also I think we should probably talk about after Lord Kane's blog, because it's not directly related, is the impact this has on current accounts, um, so trade yes. imbalances. Mm. Um, because obviously th this is another big factor of MT that you didn't mention on your video AA, um, which is that if you maintain deficit spending, then you're going to create a current account surplus. Uh, sorry, a current account deficit. You're going to cause a trade imbalance. And mm. the, the irony of this is that one of the main ideas of the modern monetary theory is to reduce unemployment. But in the long run, if you maintain a trade deficit, you're going to decrease aggregate demand, which increases unemployment. So mm -hmm. it's the whole thing is just it's extremely short termist, which is that you can use that term to sum up all of Keynesianism. <laughs> so so back, back to his three core principles. We discussed number yeah. one fairly well. Number two. Mm. The government is not revenue constrained in the way it was under the gold standard because it is the creator of its own fiat money. Well, of course, this is the massive complaint about not being on the gold standard from the Austrians, right? Is that the government uh, gets into wars and does all kinds of nasty stuff uh, that it has no business doing because it can kind of in this indirect, confusing way mm. fund itself, right? Now, so now I, I agree. I, I think yeah. I agree. Right? Now, 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 can I can I just say one thing about this? Okay, mm. in my video, I took pains to point out that this, the idea of uh, increasing the money supply leading to inflation, is not purely a, a function or a feature of fiat money, which is why I included the stuff about the California gold rush, which mm -hmm. did create a massive inf uh, inflation in the eighteen yeah. fifties. Okay. This was an influx of gold from private sources, from people like li literally panhandlers and people like setting up their own gold gold mines, literally in 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 the Wild West in California, which led to a massive increase in the amount of gold. And because got the, the gold standard was used at that time, um, you know there was a, there was an injection of cash into the into the money supply uh, all of a sudden, and this created inflation. Uh, that wasn't done by governments; that was literally done by private prospectors. 
Um, and that's why I included that in there because it's not some act. You know, we do have a problem with fiat currency. The problem is, is that it's so easy to do that. It's just right. like literally clicking a mouse now. Yeah, exactly. You know, whereas whereas back it's, in the day, yeah, you actually you physically had to go to a gold mine and dig. You know, find gold, dig it out, process it. You know, all of this. So it's much harder to massively increase the money supply uh, under the gold standard, which is why we like it because we don't we don't want um, governments doing this sort of thing. But uh, I don't actually disagree with 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 the right. second point that they so, made. So, quick point since we're going a little deeper on this one on this stream. Um, yeah. Quick point of history of economic thought is that that's exactly how the span of scholastics started some of the best thinking here on money and inflation. Is the um, they went to the new world and you know as you know Spain brought back a lot of uh, gold and silver I think both right yeah um, and they <laughs> saw the effects on the Spanish economy. And they were like, what is this? <laughs> and they're trying to understand it. And that is actually some of the better thinking on these things can trace directly right back to a hard money inflation from the- yeah, It's the same thing with work. oil. I mean, this is why they, I mean, Thomas Sowell has this in basic economics. This is the reason why they always say that we have oil running out. It's not because the physical commodity on a global basis is running out. It's because it's running out at the price level that they currently have to drill the oil wells that they have tapped. Um, they will only go and prospect for new oil wells if the price increases to such a level. And mm -hmm. so it's confined by price margins, which uh, fiat money, of course, isn't. Mm. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. You're saying we don't dig up all the oil possible because it'd be too expensive. So it, there's a natural, it, it, limit, yeah. natural limiting factor to exactly the, 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 exactly the, the oil there. supply. Exactly, there's a natural right. limit, yeah. Yeah, like the shale oil, for example, was, I, I gather, I'm not in that industry, but I gather it was not very economic for a long time. And then finally, uh, it, the, the process, it became uh, uh, cost effective to spend the money to figure out how to get oil out of shale. Am I getting that wrong, Jack? Mm -hmm. Maybe you know that industry better than me. <laughs> uh, no, it sounds about right. Yeah. yeah. And, and just to see, so we'll probably come back to this, but uh, another person in the history of economics who spotted this uh, kind of uh, the way that increasing the money supply induces uh, inflation and all sorts of other things um, was Richard Cantillon. Um, and and mm -hmm. he knew this because he himself was involved with something known as the Mississippi bubble. Right. Um, right. Well, which is where, yeah, it's where he made his fortune. Yeah. yeah I mean, I mean, Richard Cantillon was one of the world's first millionaires. I mean, I mean, this guy, I think there's the rumor has it that he was murdered by like a guy posing to be a, a baker or something, but he was, he was literally murdered. He was one of the most hated men in the world at this, um, because, uh, it, France was basically bankrupted. I mean, the French revolution, um, there's an argument to say that if the Mississippi uh, bubble hadn't happened, um, the French Re the French Revolution probably would have not have happened, because the uh, Louis the Fourteenth and Louis the Fifteenth, they they did a lot of this uh, printing of money, in order to try to get themselves out of the hole that was created by the by the um, the bust after the Mississippi bubble burst. Of course, Cantillon. He got out early and sold all his sold all his shares in these Mississippi companies. He made an absolute fortune. Everybody else was completely buggered. Um, it, it, it basically destroyed the economy of uh, of the um, what do you call that era of France, like the pre-revolutionary France, urban France or something. Yeah, I mean, it, it basically wrecked the. It, it, yeah, it, it basically wrecked that way of. I mean, you know, I complain how how much I complain about Rousseau and all these guys. There's an argument to say that um, they were basically created out of the ashes of this yeah. economic crisis that came uh, before the French Revolution. Now, uh, to, be, to be fair, it was yeah. John Law's fault, and Cantillon just understood economy well enough to say, okay, well, if you're all going to be suckers, I might as well benefit from it, you know. Yeah, and I, we'll, <laughs> yeah and we'll, 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 get back, we'll get back to this, because when um, Keynes says later on, uh, we've never seen Cantillon effect. I mean, Cantillon yeah, himself exactly. was literally there. It's named Cantillon effect because he was literally there and he knew what was going yeah, on. Yeah, and it happened twice. 
It happened twice. <laughs> it was in Mississippi, and also there was a South Sea bubble where the exact same mm -hmm. thing happened. Right, right. Okay, so number three. So yeah, one, yeah, and two, one and two, you know, he's being sort of lawyerly how is he stating them, but he's not saying anything false, right? I mean, I, I think one and two we can agree with. Um, yes. But number three, I'm hesitant to jump on board because I don't totally know what he's getting at. In a fiat money world, taxes and bond issues do not, technically speaking, finance government spending. They don't? Fi okay, okay, finance is the magic word there, right? And you guys are going to have to walk me through this because I... I, I can see, I can almost see the game that's being played, but I can't, couldn't spell it out for you. Finance. <laughs> I mean, this I, is I, Keith's wood video. I mean, I, I honestly, I, I honestly don't really know what he's getting at. Oh, you don't I, either. Okay, Jack, no, do, you, no. do you get it? Do you get the the game that's being played? This, this is um, this whole thing's laid out in Keith Wood's video, which also <laughs> I, I don't know if any of you caught this, but these three. Uh, kind of premises, if you want to call them that, uh, they are word for word the exact same in that video. So you know who wrote the scripts there. Um, it clearly wasn't. Yeah, Keith. yeah. I mean, Kay yeah, Keynes was Keynes was behind the the lad Woods. I I know this. I didn't know that. <laughs> oh wow. Yeah, he, he was he was clear. I mean, come on. But but anyway, well, yeah, like, like, at the end of the video, Keith specifically says, you know, I, I want to thank Lord Keynes for his advice on this. Oh, but the okay. fact that it's word for word makes me think that it wasn't advice so much as it was literal <laughs> script writing. Right, but that's, that's it, the point. But my my understanding, though, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that as, as I was saying before you came back, Jack, I believe in the MMT way of viewing the world. Taxes are money destroyed, um, whereas government right. spending is money created. Okay, um, and the bond the bond mm -hmm. issues are. Um, a kind of an in indirect way of raising the of raising the capital, I guess. Um, they can issue bonds um, in exchange for money from like all of these investment banks and all of the big uh, all of the big um, asset management firms. Uh, as I talked as I talked through in in my video on it on government bonds, if you remember, um, you know, in Europe they are mandated to take a certain amount of bonds. You know, th there's uh, other than liquid cap, other than just straight cash, the only other thing that they're allowed to have on their asset balance sheet, um, you know, they all of the other assets have got like percentage quotas on them, so they have to keep a certain amount, you know, in stocks and a certain amount in this. But there mm. are only there are only two straight cash and uh, government bonds that 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 have an unlimited amount. So so basically, they fill up on all the others and anything beyond then has to be kept in cash or bonds so they're basically they basically force the the financial sector to buy all of these bonds when they, when they issue them pretty pretty much because they've got nothing you know otherwise they're stuck just holding straight cash which which they do as well but um yeah so so okay so yeah. jack do you understand number three do you understand the the card trick that's being played here because normally when we, people government taxes and they use the money they tax to spend but he's saying they it doesn't finance it? What? My, my interpretation is this is what he's basically saying should be the case rather than what is the case, if that makes sense. Hmm. Um, like in, in the video with Keith Woods, for instance, he said the taxes, their only purpose really should be things such as paying uh, public employees and, and offering things such as welfare. Um, he says that the specific funding should come from obviously creating money. Um, and so I, I guess it's it's more of obviously he's, he hasn't worded it like this, which is why we're confused. But I, I think it makes more sense if we look at it in terms of this is what he thinks should be the case rather than what really is, because obviously this isn't the case really. You know, I mean, I, I don't I'd understand it more if he'd left the bonds out um, because I, I know they've got this idea that taxes is money destroyed. I don't understand uh, why the bonds are in there. To be honest, um, so yes, um, okay. So those are the three features. If um, if this is the case, why why do governments bother to tax or issue bonds? Would be the well, immediate. Uh, as I said, uh, as I said, they believe that it's to do things such as pay the public sector employees and and the bureaucrats. Yeah, but why not just pay them out of? Uh, well, that's that's what I wondered. 
uh, Lord Kendall <laughs> to answer that. <laughs> okay, yeah. Because, because in in their way of the, in their way of looking at things, when I when I say taxes is money destroyed, they need to sporadically destroy money. Otherwise, there'd be too much. Otherwise, there'd be too much money in the in you know they don't want too much money in the money supply so taxes is a kind of like um oh. it's almost like like house cle it's almost like kind of housekeeping uh, but I someone don't, in the I, chat has just yeah. put a really good point which i forgot um this is a, a key part of it it's the taxes are there to control inflation um but this is once they get to full employment right okay which which is which is the only the only scenario where inflation happens in the in their view as i as i talked about in the video but i still don't get why the bonds are included here or why bonds are ever necessary in this way of viewing the world what what what, what is uh i, I can't maybe, really see what it's there for maybe this is how they want to uh inject the money supply into the system you see you said one of the things that doesn't make sense to me um and uh, back before i blocked him i got into this with him before is I said, the reason that QE, right, wasn't inflationary was because, as I talk through, most of most of those assets remain stuck in what people call M3, money supply, right? right? That, right. That, that is, it's not the money, it's not in general circulation. It's not, you know, when, when me and you go down to the ATM machine and we get, you know, 10 and 20 pounds out, the, or, you know, or when, when I look at my bank account, my checking uh you know, current account, which are, which my wages come into, you know, and I, I want to, you know, pay for something on Amazon. All of this money is in the M1 uh, money supply, right? Mm -hmm. And then M2 includes a few other things like a like like savings accounts and things like this. But then M3 is like stuff like you know the the asset balance sheet of Goldman Sachs. That money doesn't yeah. doesn't really enter into the real economy. Right. I, which, I it literally was like sitting in the bank's reserves a lot of right it. yeah it, it, it's all just it's all just it's all just sitting there and that is why qe qe specifically didn't have this effect of massive inflation that everybody was talking about because the money never really left the vaults right. now mm -hmm. I, th I i think the central the central bankers and the planners back in 2008 were planning for more of that money to reach the the real economy but in practice, it didn't work like that because a lot of the a lot of the uh, asset management firms and so on just just sat on it. Basically, they just sat on the liquidity because it was such a a kind of risk averse environment. Uh, and if they did if they did uh, spend the money, um, they you know it wasn't reaching Joe Blogs. It was you know um, it was in assets. It, it was in assets. It, it just stayed in the world of finance. It never got into the. It never went anywhere else. So it's not really inflating the M1 money supply, whereas yeah. whereas their plan, as I understand it, is they want to pay for like builders, ditch diggers, you know, uh, council employees, whoever, through this mechanism. And I don't know how it works. How do they get the money from M3 to M1? Because they, they, because they, they, if you argue with them, they'll say, "Oh, look." Inflation didn't happen when we did QE, right? But hmm. QE wasn't financing all of these kind of uh, Keynesian, you know, bridge building schemes. It wasn't paying Joe Bloggs. It was it was just stuck in Wall Street. You know, the money never left Wall Street, essentially. So I don't understand that part of their that part of their thinking, or even if this, that's even occurred to any of them, or if they ever talk about it anywhere. So to stay with the QE thing for the ten years yeah. ago thing, I mean. Wouldn't you say that really all it ended up doing was being just sort of a pure bailout? That is, it, it sat on the balance sheets and let them not declare bankruptcy. Um, but it didn't have, as you said, the wider effects of uh, having monetary inflation throughout the whole economy because it just sat in, in the bank's reserves or whatever. Is that it, a reason? It, it didn't necessarily it? just sit there because they would invest it in assets that they think it would hold money to you know for them um and so i think there's a list i can't remember all of them specifically but there's like this list that that goes around that it's like these are the things to watch whenever they inject into the money supply because this is where you know the bankers will invest their money and it's things like the housing markets uh defense crypto 
uh, all these sort of things. These are the places where you get the asset price bubbles. Mm -hmm. But but the the release of that even if even if some of that money did reach the real economy, the it was so delayed. It took such a long time, and it right, dripped, yeah. it, it it dripped out at such a rate that it didn't really cause. You know, there were some people who were saying, well, m maybe this will cause hyperinflation, but that never happened because of the way it was released. But that would that 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 would not happen under the MMT as plans because they're not planning mm -hmm. on giving all of they're not planning on releasing this money through Goldman Sachs. You know, you know, yeah. they're, they're, they're planning on paying government employees direct, essentially giving it to the man on the street. So clearly that's going to go into the M1 money um, for people who are kind of um, just trying to keep up here with we, sh we should probably. That the money supply is usually segregated into four bits, right? Um, mm -hmm. So M M M one is just basically the the, the re, you know what I call the real economy. It's the it's people uh, going to Tesco's and Sainsbury's and buying consumer goods and me getting paid and all, all of the all of the money that we have it is in is in M one. Um, M two includes savings. M three includes the you know all of the financial sector. There's M four as well, which is like everything. Mm -hmm. That's like that's all of the money, right? Yeah, uh, M4 is an interesting one because uh, you saw this effect occur just before inflation during the 70s in the UK. Um, so in the UK, uh, obviously, there was a housing and stock market boom between 71 and 74. Um, yeah. But part of this was because in 1971, they passed a bill called the Competition and Credit Control Bill. And this increased the amount of M4 money there was in the economy. Um, but what you specifically saw was that a lot of this money shifted first to corporate and financial sectors rather than the household sectors. A lot of excess cash went into equities and properties, um, increasing their prices. But then also you saw, because it's not the same as QE, um, you saw inflation kick in. Uh, it was delayed. And so this is proof of the Cantillon effect. But it still fed into the rest of the economy. And by the end of the 70s, you saw a rise of close to 20% inflation per year. Right. So, so, so that was a, that was an example of when M4 uh, was, was affected. Is that, is that what they typically call the, the stagflation that, that happened in the, in the, in the, in the mid to late seventies there, or, or is that something else? Uh, it could be, I, I don't know if they necessarily class it as that. I, I, they had this idea that you couldn't get a recession and and uh, in, and kind of controlled inflation at the same time, but they had both. Basically, they had like right, yeah, inflation. yeah. So this, this proves this proves uh, the Phillips curve. So, um, so, so, so anyway, um, I've just seen somebody say plug the Discord. So, um, if you uh, if you're enjoying this uh, kind of slightly more detailed discussion than we usually have. Um, if you join the Discord, you'll you'll get into a place called Unpopper Academy, which is like a, well, I call it the holding bay. If you if you kind of prove yourself in there, you'll get into the deep law one day, which is where the uh, where the real autism happens, I guess. But um, anyway, the, shall the we? Link, the link is in the show description. Yeah, I've just put the link in there. Shall we? Uh, shall we carry on with uh, with with uh, Keynes then? So we don't. Yeah. He's being loyally, as you said, because he's trying to skirt around the origin of money stuff that I was talking about in the in the first half of my video. Um, and then he's saying uh, th his third claim here is much more contentious. There's a name for this technique, isn't there? Where you say two things that are really everybody easy to agree with. <laughs> and then uh, and then a third thing is like, what? hold up. Um, a third like wild thing. And that's what he's done Two very reasonable statements followed by something that see, does not seem real reasonable. Yeah, to, to, to be clear, I'm confused by number three because on the face of it, it just sounds absurd. Taxes yeah, I, I think don't, it's don't have just, anything to do with uh, government spending? What? what? There's some lawyer ball thing going on here. That's what he thinks should happen. But one of the issues I had with these three principles um, is how manipulative they are to basic, because what he's basically saying is that you cannot criticize MMT unless you address these three points. But why? Because, I mean, there's so many criticisms of MMT that have nothing to do with this. 
like for instance, I mentioned the current current accounts, and there's the, the practical issues like the fact that there might be a clash of interest between a central bank and a government. There's so many different issues that have nothing to do with these three points. Mm. And so the fact that he's, he's at the start of his blog saying, you know, AA in his video hasn't addressed these points properly makes it sound like these are the only things that you have to address if you want to criticize MMT, which isn't the case. Right. right. And so it's he, he's being really manipulative there. We, we should we should probably point out as well. I was talking through the uh, the M1, the M2, the M3. Uh, there is something else to say as well, which is the distinction between central bank or in America's case the Fed. Okay, so in in Britain it's the Bank of England, and it in America it's the it's the Federal Reserve, um, and the government budget. You know the the, the yeah. thing that um, the thing that in Britain. Uh, Oh, what's his name? Uh, Rishi Sunak is in charge of the the government budget. Oh, okay, God. whereas whereas the uh, the governor of the Bank of England is in charge of the Bank of England, and these two things are not synonymous: the Bank of England and the the Chancellor's budget. Um, do we want to say any more more about that? But what's the relationship between those two things before we? Because I, well, I feel like Keynes is skirting around that somewhere. They they make well. a, they they make a lot of how. I mean, first of all, yes, they are distinct, but. A lot is made of how these are um, independent. The Federal Reserve is independent from the the government and how it spends money and so forth, right? And who's president? Um, and I assume the same is done in the UK. The Bank of yep. England is yep. viewed as this godlike independent thing, right? That is, yep. is uh, at arm's length, at least from day-to-day -day politics and party politics and so on and so forth. Um, whereas in practice, uh, many have long suspected that there's a much closer relationship than anyone would like to admit, right? Oh, well, <laughs> I don't want to go too far off topic, but um, there was a, a long argument that I and many others from the deep law were engaged in with some of these patriotic alternative people on Twitter. Mm. And their whole idea was, you know, that the, the issue with the central bank, the Bank of England is uh, that it's run by the Rothschilds. Um, but I didn't understand the point because their their idea was that the solution to this was to nationalize it, but it's just replacing one monopoly with another. So, right. Um, yeah. yeah. If our if our guys are in charge of the central bank, then it'll be okay, right? But, right. I mean, exactly. But sure, surely any suspicion that the um, there's any real independence there has just been completely the, the the lid is blown off that by coronavirus. It's just obvious. It's yeah. obvious. I mean, in this country, Rishi Shunak just said, came out and said, "Yeah, we're basically going to bail everyone out. Here's uh, <laughs> here's here's two thousand five hundred pound each. How are you going to oh, talk to the Bank of England? We'll sort it out. Uh, you know, right, and, right, right, and, right. and 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 the, they did the same in America. I mean, what what, what right, did the right. Fed? What did the Fed add to its balance sheet? Something ridiculous, like three trillion dollars or something stupid. Right, right. Yeah, mm. that, it sounds like uh, Rishi Sunak. It, it almost sounds like. Uh, the the Bank of England might have heard about this from from reading the paper, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, you know, it's it's kind of so so the idea, the idea that they're not on the phone to each other and planning strategy together is is surely absurd at this point. Yeah, yeah. yeah but but but, yeah. Uh, but anyway, technically speaking, they're two different things. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yes. I mean, my my understanding is, and I think most people's understanding would be, that a government like the Tory government of this country, for example, in order to do anything needs to raise the money through taxation or through other schemes like, for example, raising like tariffs. That's another way that uh, governments have raised revenue, right? Um, mm -hmm. how, how else can they do it? Or they can issue or they can issue bonds, right? Is that? Yeah. I mean, that's pretty much it for the government. Like, how or, else can they go? Uh, borrow from abroad. They can borrow. They can just t straight take a loan from the private sector yeah. or from from a foreign from country. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so any specifically, uh, specifically, we should point out that um, in order for MMT to work, you need both the central bank and the government on the same page because it requires deficit spending, which is something that the government is responsible for, and it requires the money printing. Which is something the the central bank is uh, is is responsible for, and also in their scenario where they get to full employment, you then use the taxes to cancel out the inflation, um, and of course we can see a whole host of issues there because it it implies that you can just raise and lower taxes 
without any sort of political repercussions, which we know mm. are a serious factor in a lot of politics. It, can I can I just ask what's causing in their in their see my understanding from reading the reading through their materials was that um, the thing that's causing inflation when you get to full employment is the fact that there's a bidding war between the government and the private sector, which was which will bid prices and wages and things up. Um, like surely that's like surely that's not there. How is taxation going to sort this out? How is taxation going to stop that happening? I don't I don't really understand. Because um, they, they think taxation would make it worse. I mean, they, they but they reject the idea that the that the total money supply is the thing that's causing inflation, which is what all of us think, or, or yes. certainly what I certainly what me and Radlib think. I'm guessing what you think that as well, Jack. I mean, most I, most I think people. Most people, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's obvious. I mean, it's, we'll 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 get we'll get through it later on in the stream. To me, it's uh, it's obvious why that is, um, yep. and it's just a, it's a, it's a logical thing. But it, I'm just thinking, like in their thinking, how is the taxation solving this problem of the bidding war? I don't I don't get that. I guess maybe if it's corporate taxes, they think that it will put. No. Nah. Doesn't, yeah, because they, they they want to they want to get the government out of the competition. Then, right? Ideally, they want to get the government out of the competition and let the private sector take over that part. But how are you going to do that through taxing people? It doesn't. It just. It just I, I no guess maybe point. maybe if you increase taxes on individuals, then it would reduce consumption because obviously people have less disposable income, and a reduce in consumption could potentially lead to lower prices across the board. Like that's the closest I could put it. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, all right. <laughs> so point, points two and three from Lord Keynes two. I, I when I was scanning this article originally, I was just like, why? Why would we spend time on this? Because he basically, as we referred to earlier, um, says we don't need the shardless theories of the origin of money to be true. We can still yes still do MMT. So it, it kind of makes part of me just thinks. Well, okay, let's just skip all this origin of money stuff, and why argue about it if you don't care about right. it? Yeah. I don't care about it either. I, I do. I do want to spend some time on this though, okay. because okay. I did. I did get people in the comments. I don't know if they were MMT, MMTers or just people who've done this stuff in university or something, um, saying, "Oh, well, look, uh, anthropologists haven't found evidence of a wow. barter-only economy and all this sort of stuff." And you've got to understand. What? Yeah, you've you've got to understand that. For Carl Menger's theory, and it's not really Carl Menger's theory, right? John Locke thought this. David Hume thought this. Mm -hmm. You know, you me me the progression theorem. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, it's Menger is just basically, um, you know, he puts it in a really articulate way. But he's not the he's by, by far not the first guy to think about the emergence of commodity money in the, in in this way. David Hume and, and Locke did as well. If you look at the way that all of those guys discuss this issue. They're not talking about the barter economy as a, some real historical moment. Okay, they're talking about why money would emerge and what would happen if if you didn't have money. And if you didn't have money, you'd mm -hmm. have this you'd have this problem of the double coincidence of wants. And in fact, right? right. Maybe a better better way to come at it is um, they're they're trying to solve the puzzle of why do we even leave barter? Why do why don't we just do barter? I mean that's right. in a way what they're trying to explain. Why not? Why isn't it just barter all the time? Right. So mm -hmm. so 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 it, in a way it's just a mental construct. Um, right. And then they and then they relax assumptions. They relax assumptions. So what would what would the economy look like if we didn't have money? Oh well, we'd all have to barter. Okay. So it's but obviously because it's so obvious that you'd have this problem, the double coincidence of wants. You never have this moment where people are just bartering, right? And if you read Locke, when yeah, uh, except in, for in extreme cases like what you mentioned in your video, um, so well, if, if you re if you read Locke, where where I'm to, to to my mind, he kind of uh, is one of the first guys to to really. I don't know if the, did the Scholastics talk about this. I have no idea, but uh, it, my my understanding is that Locke is one of the first people to really think in this way. Um, he's describing John Locke the emergence of human beings, okay, civilization, 
from the hunter-gatherer stage, right, to establishing property rights. It's literally the move from being hunter-gatherers to settling down and homesteading and establishing farms and things like this, okay? So when people come with all of these examples of, oh, there was this tribe here and there was this tribe there and Mm. there's this chieftain over here, it's irrelevant because John Locke is talking about a civilization where they have property and where they where they have um uh what's the word they use for property it's like it, it's genuine property it's it's traded it's um you can isolate it you can exchange it um so you have a, a real market economy emerges okay and you can only have this when you start getting farmers who are like right this bit of land is mine and if you come if you come into this bit of land i'll, I'll attack you basically um and then from that you get the emergence of uh of government and the state of all all the rest of it but it starts with the fundamental idea of the property rights um and if you look at the way Locke is writing he imagines that there's monetary exchange he imagines there's money and currency right from the very beginning Mm. i.e the whole process hasn't even hasn't even started and you already have people being paid wages and things like this so Mm. There is no moment of the barter economy. It's just a kind of straw man. It's not like nobody says this. But I, I've, yeah. I saw it so many times. I thought I better explain that, unless anybody else has anything to add. Well, right. And so Kane, Lord Keynes too is saying that because money can arise in well, he's saying money can arise in other ways, and therefore Munger's Munger's theory is flawed, cannot be considered a universal theory. Oh, and then he he gives textual evidence that he believes shows, and I I don't know Monger well enough to argue here, but that uh, Monger himself said that it could be instituted by way of legislation. Now, if that quote's right, and and perhaps it is, I would just say that Mises probably did not think that. (laughs) Yeah, well, it's, uh, I mean, even even some Austrians say this about Menger. Like, part of the issue with his work is, like, in the first line, I think, uh, he says, you know, if um if if it wasn't the case then there would be legislation that we could trace that shows it but you kind of need to look beyond in order to understand it which is the point that aa is getting at here it's even if mega writes this the whole idea is that it's a praxeological law you know the idea is to deduce deduce some basic principles of science um between the exchanges of individuals and so we can assume that whenever uh, there isn't a society using money, then they would barter, even if it wasn't necessarily the physical case. It's this, it, it's praxeology, right? Um, and the evidence, as far as you need evidence of praxeology, that we have it, is in the cases throughout history where societies have decided to barter rather than use money. So in the video, AA uses the POW camps, and similar things happened during the Roman Empire during Diocletian's yeah. time, where they would literally give grain and things to each other as a form of now, barter rather than the, money. There's an interesting move they make here, which is um, in, in, a, in a strange way, I don't know if he's done this deliberately, but Keynes has almost used Mises' regression theorem back on us by saying in the POW camps, what's going on there is that they're familiar with money in a price system already, and they're basically just copying it. So that they they know it already, and they're just using matchsticks or cigarettes in place of dollars because they already know dollars are up and running. So in a way, it's kind of like Mises regression theorem, but just kind of back at us type thing. Um, hmm. But I mean, any response to that idea that it's just like hmm. you know, I think the like, whole section is just a red herring. Really, it's it just doesn't matter. Oh, okay, but let let me respond to that. Um, uh, okay, let me just get my thing straight. So um, this makes it sound, uh, he says, the people in the POW camps were already perfectly familiar with money in a price system. So I think there the idea is that what's to be explained is someone coming up with the notion of money. And once the notion of money is in people's heads, there's nothing to explain anymore. You throw them into a prison camp, they go, oh, we know about money. What shall our money be? I guess we'll use cigarettes. Um I don't think that that's what the Austrians feel is the puzzle to be solved here. The puzzle to be solved is why would we, um, uh, why, what, how would anyone know what the value of the unit of exchange is? Like, how do you know how much 
um, a piece of gold should yeah. buy. Yeah. Do you follow? Do, 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 do you know what's interesting? I, I discovered something. I left it out the video because I was already lo running long. But I discovered in my um, in my research for the uh, for the uh, thing that um, in prisons they've stopped using cigarettes as the as the unit of, as the medium of exchange because there was some federal ban on it in two thousand and four. Does anyone know what's emerged since cigarettes? Oh, there's no. a new, there's a new uh, medium of exchange in prisons in America. Anyone know? I don't know. It's no. it's it's ramen noodles. <laughs> <laughs> so so now ramen noodles are the yeah, are the are the currency. So um you know it, it just goes to show um there are and and there's all sorts of reasons why it's ramen noodles. Um, so, so um, it, it just goes to show you that it's like, well, you know, um, something will emerge, some, and and it will emerge because it has, you know, one or all of. I mean, I can't remember how many properties, or is it four or five? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Has to, has to be fungible. It has to be portable. It has to, you know, be durable. Right. Yeah. Um, mm. it has to have value in and of itself, and right. that's why it's the cigarette or the or the ramen noodles in the prison. Because they are yeah. wanted items in and of themselves. Right. As opposed to Douglas Adams' hilarious example of the leaves from the trees, you know, the abundant leaves from the trees and somebody just saying, leaves are now money. And of course, it's absurd, right? Because leaves just have no value. <laughs> but, but I feel like, I mean, I don't know if anyone's ever read um, Matt Ridley's The Evolution of Everything. Um, but in that book, he uses this phrase, skyhook, Okay skyhook explanations for things and it feels to me that the people who have this chartless way of viewing money imagine that everything in the world needs to be invented by someone it needs to have a single origin that nothing can emerge spontaneously um whereas the commodity yeah the commodity money way of looking at things has no inventor it just Right. happens it just kind of right. spontaneously emerges right. that is like, we, we would expect it to emerge in parallel across the world say yeah. or over and, and over again in new circumstances right, right. And, and it just so happens that now it's ramen noodles and it just so <laughs> happens in history that it was gold that it was gold and it's not a, it's not an accident that it was gold yeah. it, you know all sorts of re but it just so happens that it, that it emerged this way not one not one person needed to say aha i've got an idea that you know we're going to use this for money right it just right. kind of happened right 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 we don't point back to the inventor of the notion of using gold as money and celebrate them as a great genius, like the one who found penicillin, yeah. right? And, and the, 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 the other problem with this, so we won't linger on it too much longer, is when he's talking about ancient people who lacked a monetary system, it doesn't, these ancient people don't matter because Locke and Hume and those guys are talking about when you have a market economy with property rights up and running already. So you, so you, it's, it's, it's always civilizational, never pre-civilizational in the way that Locke is talking. Uh, and I don't hmm. think that is obvious to everybody. You have to kind of read Locke carefully to know that both, you know, all of these guys are assuming a system of private property rights up and running already. Okay. And you can't have, you can't have that if you're a nomadic tribe living in Africa somewhere. It, you know, they, they didn't have property rights. These sections mm. two and three are just maddening, because right, Jack? Because he's like, "Hey, it's no, it doesn't really matter anyway. We can still, you know, push for MMT even if money came about the way the Austrians oh. think." And then at the end, he's saying, he he's giving examples of how Lydia and Greece uh, invented metal coinage and so on and so forth. So, does it matter or does it not matter? I'm, I'm. <laughs> Yeah, he's talking about he's talking, he's, talking, he's talking about like it's... people in people in Papua New Guinea. I mean, th <laughs> these these aren't these are not the agricultural societies that the uh, that we have in mind when we're talking about uh, money or currency. In fact, um, the game Civilization is quite a good one because in Civilization, if you ever play that game, currency is a, is an actual invention. It's like you invent mm. writing, you invent the wheel, you know, currency is like a stage that your civilization has to go through, right? Pa the Papua New Guineans didn't reach it. They never got to that tech. It, uh, that's another way of putting it, I guess. Um, 
so yeah it, I, I all of this all of this seems quite relevant to me um in yep. uh, in in what we in what we've been talking about okay but then um academic agent fails to understand widespread relative price rigidity okay so a comment may be in order this is, yeah. is this is his hobby horse is that the right term to use i mean he just brings this up all the time and i have to say i don't completely grasp what he thinks this does for him he seems oh. to think it just destroys all of price theory or something and and mm. i don't get it to me it's it's a uh let's see it's it's a very mildly interesting, if at all, interesting uh, yeah. feature of how real economies function. And that, you know, or I would put it this way, there's a cost to changing prices. You know, like imagine right. you run a store and you have to run around and relabel in yeah. all the aisles. You gotta change the prices, right? So you don't just do it like every five minutes. That would be costly. It, it, you'd you'd lose so much doing the price changes that you'd get no benefit from the price changes, right? If you're right. running around changing the prices constantly. So it, it, it's sticky in that sense, just because in real life, everything's sticky, everything costs, everything is an, has an opportunity cost. Changing prices has an opportunity cost. And so- And that's why it's so much quicker online. Yeah, yeah right. No, no, Amazon, um, Amazon is doing that craziness of, <clears> of changing it every five minutes, right? They're changing it every five seconds. They're changing their prices constantly, I gather, because because uh, they can do it in a costless manner. Go go ahead. To, to, just to explain of the, uh, this a sec, this is Lord Keynes is what he thinks is a silver bullet, okay? Yeah. Which which automatically debunks all of Austrian theory, <laughs> not just all of Austrian theory, all of neoclassical theory too. Yeah. Right. 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 Because, right. Because you have this phenomenon that. Um, uh, prices are, uh, are are inflexible okay they are they are sticky they they don't change as rapidly as uh, economic theory will have you believe okay um so to just to, just to make things super super simple um imagine you have some good that you're used to buying i don't know pot noodles say ramen noodles and they're one pound to buy and you're used to spending one pound on that good not one pound fifty or two pounds uh, we can expect it to stay in in or around one pound for quite a long time, right? This this is this is basically what you're saying. Or the the, the one the one which I think is a bit more cast iron than pr uh, the prices of consumer goods is uh, is wages. Um, imagine you're used to being paid ten pounds an hour, and there's some downturn in the economy, and your employer goes to you, right right uh, right Jack, I want to pay you nine pounds an hour now. In fact, I want to pay you eight pounds an hour. In fact, I might let you go unless you take seven pounds an hour. You, as the employee, are not really going to want to take seven pounds an hour when you're used to taking ten pounds an hour. So they call this, um, you know, they they say wages are sticky. It's very difficult, actually, in practice, to get a guy who's used to being paid ten pounds an hour to get to take seven pounds. So in practice, you you tend not to get uh, uh, wages going down in that way. Um, easily right yeah they get they go down because people let go of employees and then they have to take a job at a lower rate <laughs> yeah i mean more more right? more like more likely what would happen is be like jack sorry we're gonna have to let you go uh, jack's real wage is now zero and then right. he has to go out and get a new job and he gets paid seven pounds because that's all he can get on the you know and in, in the new conditions right but um but that takes a bit longer than, than simply his boss saying, right, you were on 10 pounds and now you're on seven pounds. So hence wages are sticky. Quote, right, unquote, but, but right? Just, as, just as I said about the, the not running around your store, changing the prices every five minutes, this to me is just, it's just not a super interesting aspect of the real world um, mm. that there's a little bit of stickiness there in wages and prices. It doesn't fundamentally blow apart economics. Now, if we were to find that, um, you know, he's about to turn on the Kentian effect, right? If yeah. we were to, if we were to find that, you know, you inject money into the economy, it makes it into M1. Let's let's get that out of the way, right? It actually yeah. makes it into M1. You double the money supply. Everybody's using the new money, and prices don't move for like ten years. They don't go up. They're never affected by it. I would start to have serious thoughts, serious doubts, right? But that's not what happens. And I don't think no. that's even what Lord Keynes too alleges happens. He just says it goes slower than we expect 
and our theory demands that it be really fast. Yeah, but I, I, I feel he has. I didn't know that. <laughs> I, I, I feel he has. Some, I feel he has a bit of cognitive dissonance around this point, though. Okay, mm. because he he wants this. He wants price rigidity to do so much work for him that it's basically invalidating like supply and demand. All right. And, right. Then, and then whenever yeah, whenever yeah. I call him out, whenever I call him out on this, he goes like, "Oh no, actually, of course, of course, I don't. Uh, of course, I don't." Um, not believe in supply and demand but then like in the middle of the corona see this is this is where i i genuinely thought is lord Keynes actually mad right in the <laughs> middle of in the middle of the corona crisis when it was first happening i was saying look at the price of this antibacterial hand gel or whatever it was you know people were selling it for like 17 or 18 quid it was right. sold out everywhere mm -hmm. okay um and i was saying look this is the real economy reacting to prices in real time. And they happen pretty quickly, you've got to admit. And, and then, of course, you've got all these people saying, oh, it's price gouging. It's, um, you know, and then, and then, like, the government was threatening to institute price controls. Do you remember? Mm -hmm. And so when Tesco's and Sainsbury's didn't put their prices up, he then came back and said, aha, look, Tesco's and Sainsbury's <laughs> didn't put their prices up. I was like, the government has <laughs> just threatened to you know bring like bring down on them uh you know the fire the, the wrath of god so of course they're going to play ball and by the way yeah. um they've shut down the rest of the economy so it's just like tesco's and sainsbury's and a few other companies so you know what, what difference does it make to them they'll sell out of their stock <laughs> everybody yeah, else goes with do, that all we had to do was look at ebay where the prices yes. were so much higher for the same items but no it, this is the thing is he he will only look, he, he really cherry picks his data. He'll only look at certain things that support what he wants to show you. And he, he doesn't understand that you can't do that with prices because every single company and every single action they take is based on so many different nuances. And, and so you, you cannot just give a, a general kind of idea and apply it to every, every single company there is. And it's why we say supply and demand isn't specific to companies, right? right. Because you can't measure it. It's purely a theoretical thing. It, yeah, and, but and he, listen, he doesn't seem to understand it. Yeah, let, let, let's deal with the with the with this price rigidity thing once and for all. And then we'll okay. do then we'll do the Cantillon effect stuff. Right, okay? right. So mm -hmm. so <laughs> this and the reason I'm getting animated is because I've been over this 20, 50 <laughs> times already. Right. Okay. Yes. But let, let's just do it once and once and for all. When we're talking about supply and demand and prices, okay, we are talking about the price across the economy, not the pricing strategy of an individual firm, okay? Mm, right. So exactly. it, it doesn't it doesn't actually matter what Tesco's and Sainsbury's decide that they're going to price this at, if all of the firms across the economy are bidding up that price of of antibacterial gel. In fact, the bid the price is being bid up by real customers who want it, right? And and it's a rationing mechanism. There's only so much antibacterial gel. Um, the uh, the storekeepers know that, and so um, it, so rather than have one person come in and buy all of the antibacterial gel, uh, instead um, they can put up price, and so it's whoever's willing to pay. So maybe um, I'd buy seven antibacterial uh, gels for one pound each, but if they were seven pounds each, maybe I'll just buy one. And and so, in a way, that's fairer because the second guy and the third guy and the fourth guy might might also get the antibacterial gel for seven pounds. Um, whereas in the in the system that Tesco's and Sainsbury's are doing, basically I can come in and buy them all. But then, of course, they've instituted like actual rationing. They're saying, oh, actually, you can just have one. <laughs> You're right. not allowed more than one product, which is what they've done. Which is basically just yeah. uh, another way of it's another way of doing it. It's um, a socialist way of doing it, I guess, the the actual rationing. Um, but that's, o that's only happened, that they've only had to do that because they're not actually allowing the prices to move. And the, gov yeah. the government has done that. The government mm -hmm. basically said, we're going to call this price gouge and we're going to come down on you. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, essentially, and they don't want to lose their um, privilege. I mean, we're, we're in an economy at the moment in Britain where the, and, in, and in America where the government are actually picking who are quote unquote essential workers. That's mm -hmm. the government saying yeah. this business is essential and this business is not. So the government could, the government could basically come in at any point and say, you're, you're not essential anymore. Get out. You're on, you're on the back of the bus, like Nando's and McDonald's now, you know, 
Um, so, so they want to keep their privileged status. So of course they're going to play ball with it. The corner store down the road isn't, and the guy on eBay isn't, but you know, um, so, so that's, that's also what's happening there. But also I did some, um, one of the, uh, things, and I can't believe he's done it again after so many times he's done it again. He always goes back to this study from 1998, right? Get this. I can't believe he's done it again. Oh, the blinder uh, asked me about prices. Oh, and I love it. I love it that the title of this um, is literally asking about prices, which yeah. <laughs> which is exactly your critique of it. You're asking oh. about prices. Right? We, so so it's literally we went to a hunt to 200 firms and asked them, did you change your prices? <laughs> and, and so it's a survey. It's literally a sur survey of 200 firms in 1998. And he makes this do so yeah. much work, right? So yeah, it's, I, it's, the I have same that, um, it's the same as that really famous minimum wage uh, study from a similar time. Yeah, where, and Kruger. Like, yeah. It, it, yeah, exactly. Where everyone uses this study to go, oh, you see, minimum wage doesn't really increase unemployment. But all they did was go to like every like burger joint in the local town and ask them, so did you let anyone off because of minimum no, no. wage? Did you Jack, let anyone off because of minimum wrong. wage? Jack, I'm afraid you're wrong. They didn't go to every burger joint. They went to those burger joints who had not shut down after Just, the minimum that's... wage was brought in. Oh, wow. You see? So so how so how can they... Oh, all right, Burger King, you're operating in Philadelphia. Uh, did you lay anyone off? No. All oh. oh, right. So minimum wage, <laughs> minimum, I mean, that's literally what that study is. It's awful. Wow. Um, if, if, if Sowell talks about that in uh, even in, is it in one of his books he talks about it. maybe applied economics he talks about that or vision of the united or one of those. Um, but uh, anyway, let's get back to this. I have said time and time again, why don't you just look at actual prices across the economy for individual products and see if they fluctuate? So what have I done? Hmm. I, I went on to this, uh, this book over here. Uh, these are actual prices. Look, actual prices from the, the U.S. economy in 1972, broken down by city. Look, there are the prices mm -hmm. in Atlanta, in Baltimore, in Boston, in Buffalo, uh, in Cleveland, broken down. Look, there's flour, there's corn, there's rice and so on. And I thought, well, let's just take a few of them and see how they change from month to month. So this is the this is the aggregate U.S. This is the average price across the entire U.S. economy. Okay, um, January, February, March, April, May, etc. Um, unfortunately, they didn't have every month, so I had to skip a few months. But uh, these are the ones they had. I picked them out over two years. So flour, we can see, did the did the price fluctuate from month to month? You know, these are only a couple of you know couple of a fraction of a cent. But what does that say? It means that there must have been some firms changing their prices. Otherwise, the, otherwise the number would be exactly the same. Would you agree? Right. And then we can look at the hamburger. Well, you can see the hamburger. Uh, that seems to be experiencing some sort of inflation because the, the price across two years increases by almost 10 cents. Right. But, but so it's, that, it's month by month. It isn't all in one big price change. Yeah. It's a gradual yeah movement it, it gradually now i don't know what was bidding prices well, who knows you'd have to do like a multi-factorial analysis of what's pushing burger prices up in in 1971 and 72 maybe there was a burger boom maybe maybe loads of people wanted burgers all of a sudden maybe there was maybe some beef farm went out of business who knows but something was causing this price change right um but then we have a look milk what does milk do well milk goes it goes up a little bit and then it comes down a little bit. And then, so, milk, you know, it's in and around 58 to 60, but it kind of comes up and down. Apples. Now, you see, I don't know what the reasons for these price changes are. Maybe apples are more abundant in winter and less abundant in summer. I thought, well, mm -hmm. maybe this is like seasonal change or something. Who knows? But then I saw that the, the following January, the price was really high in. in uh, so I was like, oh. So I don't actually know what the what you know, who knows what the reasons for these. But the point is, is that they change from month to month. Right. And this is this is averaged across. You've got to imagine thousands and thousands of firms across America. 
you know all every single firm selling apples in america is averaged in here somewhere so th so there must be price adjustments happening across the entire economy right and then let's look at eggs eggs start at 60 they go all the way down to 48 there now i don't know if anybody's run a farm maybe there's more eggs in the summer who, who knows but then they then they go up again by by the following winter so Right. So uh, let, let, let's let's grant Lord Keynes that it's expensive to change your prices uh, and you don't want to yeah. do it too much. And so let's say for any individual firm, maybe they only do it th every three months, but it's not the same. They're not on the same schedule. Right. Um, yeah. one, one, one store changes theirs in February. The mm -hmm. other store changes theirs in February in in, in yeah. March and the other one changes it in April. The point is, over time, the prices are changing across the economy. But but my point yeah. my, my and I I've picked out I've picked out these at random. My point here is to say, well, look, these prices aren't that sticky. You know, yeah. so, so some of some of them change by three cents in in the in the course of a year, and this is across all of the different firms. Um, another thing is to show that not all of these pro, not all of these prices move in the same direction. Mm -hmm. You can see eggs go down, whereas burgers go up. So the so and this is one of the points I, wa I was trying to make the the idea of, um, you know, all every single good in the economy increasing in price, is obviously not true. Some game price, you know, some some prices go up and other prices go down. And uh, you know, you can you can see that you can see that here. They're not all moving in the same direction, are they? Some of some of these prices go up at exactly the moment where some of them go. go go down right but if you if you look from the left and jump to the right all of them have gone up because that was an inflationary period in the united states yeah so they've all got they, yeah. they've all gone up a little bit but they didn't uniformly go up some of them right, right. some of them went in opposite directions at different times in different places right so the real economy is always yeah. a lot more is, is always a lot more complex uh is is the point i wanted to make and that and that was just that was just a couple of that was just a couple of things here but behind all of these are hundreds of other processes, you know, the whoever's growing the wheat and you know milling the flour and the, you know, th th there's somebody farming. Um, it, 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 each one of these has got a supply chain behind it, right? And this is just this is just the consumer prices at the end of the line that we're seeing. So if if there was if there was changes in these, who knows what other changes there were on the on the wholesale level and up the supply chain? Maybe there were, maybe there weren't, but. You can see that prices change. Is my point. Um, hmm. So let's uh, let's go now. So that's it's uh, it's, it's like uh, Lionel Robbins says. You know, the uh, economics is the distribution of resources that of scarce resources that have alternative uses. The only way that this can occur in a market economy is if each individual firm, each individual entrepreneur, is experimenting with their prices so that they can find the most efficient. Uh, price for whatever the circumstance is. Um, it, it wouldn't make sense if every single firm was reacting to prices in the same way. Exactly. So, um, so this whole thing about sticky prices does not do the job that Lord Keynes thinks it does. It doesn't invalidate all of economic theory. You know, just and because so many examples that disprove him as well. I mean, it's it's just unreal. You, I mean, you just have to. Like you say, you just have to go on eBay. All, 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 all like I try to show in the video. Do you remember I was showing the exchange ratio of of uh, what was it, eggs to TV sets? Do you remember I I, I showed you that? Um, yeah. That that was that's something else. You can see that the um, the, the prices of TV sets have come down faster than the prices of eggs in real terms. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and, and um, you can, if you just follow any business, you can see them experimenting. Like I, I can't remember when it was, but it. Sometime in the 90s, I remember American Airlines tried to, like, they, they cut their online prices by 86% or something because they, they were trying to encourage more of their customers to go online. Um, but within a few months, they completely abandoned it and raised the prices again. It's within each individual company, you're going to see them experimenting all the time. And so it, it makes no sense for prices to be rigid. So, so then he says. Um, so let's get on to the camp. Let's get on to the Cantillon. So yeah, he makes that do far too much work. Um, and I mean, again, you can see like um, hotels, um, petrol stations. Like these prices change on a daily basis, and you can see them change on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. It's just right. mad. It's just insane for him. To, and whenever I've done this, 
because I, I've, I've been over this with him so many times. They'd be like, look, here's the price of toothpaste over the past 10 years. Here's the price of it. He always says, oh, well, you know, some products, you know, he always, he's always got some way of worming out of it. Um, so what, mm-hmm. like, what is he talking about? Just because some, I mean, it literally boils down to because 200 price managers in 1998 uh, answered a survey in this way. I mean, it's just, it's just nuts. I can't, I don't understand what he means at all. So, so by the way, I, I think he's got the wrong end of the stick on this Cantillon thing. He says um, the Cantillon effect, uh, which briefly is that um, when money uh, is brought into the economy, it, it hits some people before it hits others. And the people who get it last um, are have the money they had in the first place, you know, before all the money got injected. Uh, but they're still facing uh, they they face the rising prices without the benefit of you know, say their wage going up or something like that. Whereas yeah. the people who get the money first, you know, the defense contractor or whatever, they they face the prices as they are initially. Um, when the money was injected, but they've just got more money to, to buy what's yeah, out there, right? So in my example, this was the bridge builders and the ditch diggers. They were the first receivers of the money. And Granny, mm-hmm. poor old Granny, who's saving right. off, saving at home and living off her pension, well, she's on a fixed income. Uh, she's not going to get the money first. She gets the money last. And ultimately, she pays for it through her savings. So Right. So, so what I don't understand is, his argument is uh, this fails because modern capitalist economy, uh, let's see, it's dependent on the view that capitalist economies are highly flexible, rapidly responsive to changes in demand. Well, no, I mean, I think the whole point of the Cantillon effect is that the people who initially get the money, uh, when the money is initially injected, it doesn't just instantly get reflected in prices. Otherwise, yes, I- they, get, they get no benefit. <laughs> Yes, and um, right. the um, Murray Rothbard has got a very way, a very good way, very easy way of uh, explaining this. He says, "Imagine, imagine that a angel Gabriel comes, okay, may, waves his, you know, does a miracle, and basically next to every person, um, uh, uh, gives like a stack of ten thousand dollars. Say, so you you wake up tomorrow, and you've got ten thousand dollars next to your bed." Which, by the and way, I, we we just had with our stimulus, right? <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So 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 Angel Gabriel does this, and everybody gets the ten grand at once. Okay. Um, and now obviously this would be this this would be inflationary, and it would be inflationary because uh, do you remember I was talking about the exchange ratio between the uh, the eggs and the TV set? Well, if you imagine yeah. all of the economy is a is a is a is a is a vast list of exchange ratios of some products versus all the other products, right? It's apples versus oranges. It's apples versus TV sets. It's apples versus eggs. It's eggs versus TV sets, et cetera, et cetera. Each of these have an exchange ratio in theory, okay? But of course, the medium of exchange uh, money um, uh, is is what we kind of use rather than rather than try to work out all these different exchange ratios all the way through the economy, okay? But of course, money itself is a commodity. It it has its own exchange ratio. So so in in my example with the TV sets and the and the eggs, okay, let's pretend that Angel Gabriel, rather than um, waving his wand and um, uh, giving ten grand to every person, okay, instead waved his wand and every single person in the entire country. Had a brand new 4K, 4K TV there instead. Okay, mm-hmm. now, 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 what would that do to the exchange ratio of eggs and TV sets? It, suddenly, a TV set would be worth massively less versus eggs. You can see this, yes. Mm-hmm. Right. Now, exactly the same is true of money. Right. It, only it's money, not TV sets. But it, it, so you're altering. The exchange ratio of money to all other goods in the economy. So, right. of co- so of course, so in the Angel Gabriel example, of course, you'd get very rapid inflation. But Rothbard says, and and he's cribbing Mises really. He's just trying to simplify Mises. Mises says, well, actually, no. In the real world, that doesn't happen. You you don't get the Angel Gabriel coming, giving money all at once. It actually drips through into the economy through. Like I said, the bridge builder, the, the ditch digger, the government employee, the the military guy, who, whoever it happens to be, right? 
um, and they're the ones who get the money first. In fact, very often it's an investment banker these days. But uh, yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> but 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 so that and that is the Cantillon effect, and it's called the Cantillon effect because in in the uh, that Mississippi bubble that we were talking about, Cantillon got his money first. And, you know, by the time an inflationary effects had kicked in, he'd already spent it. He bought a big house. He'd, you know, he was already a multimillionaire with loads of riches and assets and wealth. And uh, by the time everybody else got their money, the money had already become worthless. And they, they were basically their assets were worth nothing overnight, basically. So that's why it's called a Cantillon effect, because he could see that the time delay, uh, you know, the, the time lag, um, basically creates this effect where he was able to have all the advantages, whereas all the people further on down the line were basically buggered over. They were granny, basically. So right. So so you see yeah. where I'm you see where I'm going. I'm trying to use Keynes's point against him. We I agree that prices don't instantly change when the money uh, comes into the economy. There is a lag, and that lag is to great benefit to those who get the money first. Um. It doesn't just, uh, you know, the prices don't just instantly go up. Uh, you know, the, the Fed raises the money so supply by 2% and instantly every price in the economy is now 2% higher. It doesn't work that way. We, we know um, that, right? <laughs> yeah, no, no, there's no. loads of examples, especially with uh, asset price bubbles, which we spoke about uh, no. at the start. Do, do you think that he's talking in this way because... In, in his weird, in their strange way of doing economics, which is all about these algebraic equations and, you know, it's all very abstract, that they can't really process the time element. So they imagine that it all has to happen at once, all has, has to happen simultaneously, which is why Keynes thinks this is such a kind of gotcha to us, because he, he is not processing the time element himself. Am I am I wrong? Well, that that would be if he's coming from a very strong neoclassical, where they do a lot of assuming. You know, let's assume that. Um, you know, it's it's so they want they want to use calculus, right? Mm -hmm. So they they want to assume that everything is happening in this very finely grained way, um, and they may well. I, I'd have to think about it. I, I don't know, Jack. Do you have exposure to neoclassical stuff? Uh, yeah, but I. I my answer to why Lord Keynes thinks it's this way, mm. I'd imagine, is because he thinks that prices are so rigid that you wouldn't see any effects until everyone has their money. And so you wouldn't oh. get the first person who gets the benefit. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's just not true, though, is it? If you, right, exactly. If, if, if you know someone who's just come into money, right, the, the stuff that let's just, just pretend somebody wins the lottery, right? So it wins that just just they've just won the lottery. That that person is gonna is gonna be facing like a slightly inflated price wherever they're going, right? Not 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 like actual shops and things, but let, let's say he's trying to buy a house or you know, like, well, this guy's won the you know going to try to bid him up because you know he's got more money, right? So it it's, yeah. it it doesn't it doesn't strike me as true that um that the uh, the price lags would be that much. But also there's of course the behavior of the person who's just come into the money. Which is another, which is another part of Mises' is thinking here. You've just come into this money now, and uh, what's the old saying? Easy come, easy go. Where it says that you've just been like, how much money were you just handed, uh, Radliff, by uh, by Donald oh, Trump? Uh, let's see, twelve hundred times two adults plus five hundred times eight children. I'll let you do the math. <laughs> <laughs> right, and let's pretend you've been given like ten grand by uh, by the angel Donald Trump. Right, right. It's just, it's just like, right, are you gonna? Are you gonna treat that ten grand the same way as if you'd spent like six months trying to earn it, like six months earning it, or you've got yeah. it through like uh, you know maybe your YouTube channel takes off and uh, right, through right. like hours and hours of hard work, you know you've got ten grand. You're not gonna treat it the same way. You've just been given ten grand. Yeah. You might just go and you might just go and blow it. And if everybody's right. going to blow it, you know, um, having a party or whatever, let's just pretend you go out and buy vodka with it or whatever. Of course, this is going to like this will quite rapidly uh, cause prices to go up because suddenly there's yep. massively increased demand for all of these things. Yeah, as we've as we've seen yep. in, in in real time over coronavirus, when all of a sudden people like I, I'll get right some of the things that people like uh, random like flour at the moment. Okay, you cannot find flour anywhere in the shops at the moment. 
um because everybody's like but like at home and they're thinking oh i might do baking you know make my money go longer or i'll make my own bread i'll make pies i'll make cakes or whatever it is so you can't find flour anywhere and that now of course in 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 the big supermarkets because of what we said before they just they just say out of stock they're just rationing it basically right. but if you you know if you had um if i would really wanted to buy f- flour right i could probably find some massively inflated flour on amazon or ebay right I could probably find, I could probably source myself yeah. some like uh, boot, bootleg, you know, six pounds, six pound flour from somewhere if I wanted to, because now it's, you know, the demand has suddenly increased. So I, I don't, I don't and really on, see. Um, yeah. On an international level, you see it with uh, these face masks and everything. Um, to, to the extent that countries are paying millions for these huge shipments and other countries like the US, for instance, are just stealing these shipments. Like the, there's that much demand for them all of a sudden. Can, can, can I can I just say I'm I'm loving one of these comments here. This is probably the only time we'll ever be able to say this. Uh, let me let me. Uh, I just spotted it. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's it's it's. I'm filled with shame. Hey, I just uh, before we leave this section, I just had yeah. to say these words because I feel like we we should have a T-shirt. Yeah. Like you know, I had 500 arguments with Lord Keynes, and all I got was cost-based markup prices. <laughs> That's his magic, cost-based markup prices. Say it with me, you know? So <laughs> I'm surprised he didn't put that in his three principles at the start. Right, there. right. <laughs> so, so his major argument of, against the Cantillon effect is basically just doubling down on this, on this, pr- on, on this rigid price business. Yeah, he so, thinks it'd be so rigid that there wouldn't be the chance for the people who get it first to benefit. Oh, oh, wait, I, I, I wanted to fit this in. This this study he brings up constantly, or it's a book, it sounds like, Asking About yeah. Prices. It's by Blinder at Al. Blinder is <laughs> Alan Blinder. And he was the co-author of the first uh, time I was exposed to economics, mainstream economics. I found it utterly uninteresting and would have never dreamed that I would have been like talking about economics on YouTube someday. Because only later I, you know, stumbled into Hayek and the Austrians and suddenly found economics really interesting. But I did have to take two semesters of mainstream economics as an undergrad engineer. And Alan Blinder was one of the co-authors. This asking the price, asking about prices guy. And he almost turned me off to economics forever. <laughs> um, I, now, now, I, now I, we probably should look at this bit as well, because I feel like he's, uh, again, being disingenuous here. He says, academic age is, is an idiot. <laughs> Who denies price rigidity in many goods right before his eyes, um, mm-hmm. <laughs> and and this is where he pulls this uh, switch. He says, "We've just seen massive relative price rigidity in response to increased demand in many goods uh, during the pandemic crisis. Although, of course, some good prices have risen where production is inelastic, such as fruit and vegetables, or where supply side issues have happened. In many cases, large supermarkets have maintained the prices of goods like toilet paper, tissues, and hand sanitizer, even when the shelves are empty. Okay, what, okay. I want to challenge how- that right there because I've been looking <laughs> at those empty shelves of toilet paper myself and I've thought, thought a lot about them. Okay, in what sense is it a market price when there's nothing there? Do you follow me? <laughs> Yes. We have maintained our price on this thing that we don't have to offer to you. That's not a market price. That's a, a, a that's a label. That's a sticker a, a sticker on a shelf, right? The the, re- the hmm. reason this is so disingenuous though because in the yeah. UK case the government literally said we're going to bring in price controls unless you stick to the, your current do not try right. to we're, we're going to call it price gouging so don't raise your prices. So it's oh, just oh. like hmm. you know it's it's insane. And I did want to get in my my new favorite phrase that I think I came up with, which is I've heard of rationing by time. The idea that you know if you don't ration by price, then you end up, you end up just waiting. Say, yeah. but in the case of uh, finding toilet paper for the large family I mentioned, um, I hadn't I hadn't wasn't able to find it at all for weeks, and so it wasn't rationing by time. It was rationing by luck. If you just happened to get to the store when a shipment came in. Then you grabbed it, and everybody else grabbed it, and the shelves were cleared in five minutes. Uh, if you weren't around for those five minutes, you just didn't get toilet paper. So it's it's not even rationing by time; it's rationing by happenstance. You know, just who happens to be at the store mm-hmm. at the time. You know, I mean, some some of us. I don't want to say that some of us radlib, 
bought a shitload of toilet roll. I, I've, seen, I've seen the memes. <laughs> I could have engaged it on his throne of toilet paper. Yeah. <laughs> but that's, that, that's, 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 because, that's because I saw this coming down the pike. So even before lockdown, I got, I got, I mean, I've still got three different uh, lots of nine just under my bed. It's just been like, <laughs> I've got reserve. Oh. reserve. Um, and, uh, anyway, um, he says, academic agent is an idiot who denies the price rigidity of many goods right before his eyes. Um, this is such a, it's just unbelievable the way he pulls these uh, mental mental tricks here when he was actually the one who was denying the, um, who was actually decrying the price gouging of the, do you remember there was that um, clip doing the rounds of the guy who was like trying to charge more in the corner store? store guy yeah right yeah, yeah. And, and and um you know he was <laughs> isn't it disgusting it, it shouldn't happen so it's just like if the price system works you decry it as price gouging. <laughs> right <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah and you support the government coming in and shutting it down and then you turn around and say you see you, right. know, you know you see price reduces it's just madness i just can't i yeah. can't believe the tricks they play okay but, but anyway You're ready for section five yeah no, there's this one. There's this one last bit we have to get to. Yeah. As an aside, academic agent commits a gross contradiction in his reasoning if he wants to defend the orthodox quantity theory of money and the existence of Cantillon effects at the same time. Since Austrian economics requires the rejection of long and short-run money neutrality, but money neutrality is a fundamental assumption uh, in, of the quantity theory of money. So, what I mean. What would your immediate uh, response to to this be? Because I am not necessarily. I'm. Just, I mean, the view I'm taking is essentially uh, Mises's view of this, um, which is, uh, you know, which is the this idea of the Cantillon effects that the that the money doesn't get released all at once to everybody. It has ripple effects, and um, you know, and. Uh, Obviously, um, there's subjectivity involved, so not everybody uh, reacts the same way. But um, any any views on this before we get before we get on? I'm trying oh. to remember the quantity theory of money. It's been a while. <laughs> I'm just getting the blog up for myself. I mean, the the, the, the next bit goes on in this. So so uh, hold on. He says. Academic agent relies on the flawed quantity theory of money as his explanation for inflation. Now, nobody denies that demand side inflation is real or that hyperinflations can happen, but the quantity theory of money is much more than the claim that demand side inflation occurs. The section is unfortunately highly technical. The quantity theory of money is that when the money supply expands or contracts, this is the cause, whenever the variables are constant, of proportional or equal changes in the price level. The standard equation often used to express the quantity theory of money is the Cambridge cash balance equation. And then he goes through uh, all of this. In the Cambridge approach, the variable K uh, was held to be superior to Irving Fisher's velocity of circulation concept V, because unlike VK, it's supposed to be empirically measurable. Uh, the quantity theory of money makes the following assumptions. The size of the money supply is exogeneously determined by the central bank and there is an independent money supply from function. Number two, the, the assumption of long run money neutrality. And number three, the direction of causation as assumed in the quantity th equation is from left to right. Um, that is to say, an exogeneously determined money supply is the fundamental cause or driver of price level changes. But these assumptions are wrong. Uh, now, can I, can I just say, uh, something a second, which is that um, my my view, uh, as laid out in the video, was that um, if it is not the money supply causing the nominal inflation, then how is it that in real terms, the prices of things like eggs and TV sets and various other goods have actually come down, which we'd all recognize that a TV set is cheaper now than it was in the 1960s and the 70s. What has changed, if not the money supply between 1971 and now? That was that was that was a point I was trying to uh, isolate there by looking at those two by looking at those two uh, uh, things. Okay, 
So anyway, shall I continue? Or do you want do you want to come in, either of you guys? Uh, it's, it's, um, go ahead, Jack. Go on. Well, just point one, I'm a little thrown by because the quantity theory of money predates the existence of central banks by centuries. Yes. So I'm a little confused why he's talking about the quantity theory of money making assumptions about this, the relationship of the money supply and the central bank. Uh, the quantity theory of money doesn't hinge on the existence of the central bank at all. Yes, uh, th that's why I include the, the California gold mines, as I mentioned earlier on. Right. Yeah, right, right. Um, and uh, the, the point I wanted to make was the kind of side point. Um, I don't know if any of you know if he's ever spoken about it, but I'd be interested to know what Lord Keynes thinks about UBI if he denies inflation. I don't remember. Is he a UBI I, supporter? Anyone? I don't know. I, I don't think I've seen him discuss it, but it'd be interesting I haven't, to notice. I haven't seen him discuss that. But I mean, in my I'm, I'll be perfectly honest. My view, as I said in the video, is that in, inflation is... A, when, you, when I say inflation, inflation across the board, i.e. nominal prices are going up across the board, okay, that is always and everywhere a monetary phenomena. You, you 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 cannot you cannot have this you cannot have this thing where all prices rise, emerging on the natural market. If you had a if you had a if you had a completely fixed money supply, prices would go up and down across the economy. They 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 go they'd go up for some things and they go down for other things. Right, um, right. So, so we could imagine a crisis kind of like ours, right? Uh, where certain prices go up because certain some things are suddenly in higher demand, right? But not all prices would go up. Some prices would go down, right? So, so mm -hmm. toilet paper goes up, say, but certain luxury goods uh, go down because nobody can make use of the luxury goods. So those luxury goods at the moment, say. Mm -hmm. And even you know, within those goods, they go up and down at different prices and at different times because it depends on the individual who's selling them. Uh, absolutely, um, and uh, I mean, the, I've tried to make this point so many times with the uh, with my Coca Cola example. You know how Coca Cola was uh, fixed at uh, five nickels, at five cents. At, um, you know, had the same price for seventy years, <laughs> and uh, and and you can see um, when when there is inflation, um, sales of Coke go up, and when there is deflation, sales of Coke go down. Because right. the real the real price of coke changes depending on what all the other goods are doing right. um so 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 i'm i'm that's why i i always say the real price is the thing to look at because the real price is the thing that's not being fiddled with by somebody messing around with the money supply right mm. um yeah. as as they were from 1920 to now um but but anyway let's uh let's care is there anything else you want to add on this quantity theory of money business I don't. He 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 goes he goes on a fair bit here. He says, um, "Let me let me just uh, let me just see what else he says here." Um, he says, "A truly independent money supply function does not actually exist in an endogenous money world because private bank credit money comes into existence because it has been demanded." So the broad money supply is not independent of money demand, but can be demand-led. Thus, assumption one above is false. That's that's an assumption that we have not made, isn't it? We didn't make. See, th this is the thing. He's setting up the he's setting up these things, but this is n none none of us said this. I never said this in my video. So um, it's ironic he says this just before criticizing you for using a straw man. I mean, it's 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 kind of, it's kind of remarkable. Um, the the other thing I would say is that um, I'm not sh so sure about this idea of private bank credit money um, coming into existence because it is demanded. I think uh, we. I mean, I don't know about you, Jack, but certainly me and Radlib would be. Um, in fact, I never talked to you about the uh, fractional reserve banking, but. I'm mm -hmm. like a full. I'm like a full. You know, should be 100% gold gold standard um, to stop all of this sort of stuff ha happening. You know, right. because because of Mises's theory of money and credit. Um, so I don't know if 
uh, credit money comes into existence simply because it's been demanded. I, I would I would say that a lot of it comes into existence because um, it's being underwritten by the by the Federal Reserve or by the central bank. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I they're in an environment where they can do this and they don't have to worry about um, going under because they'll be bailed out as we've seen time and time again. So the era of having like bank runs and um, you know the, the era where a bank is punished for this sort of thing is is where is is over because they you know the Keynesians and others have not have not allowed it to happen since literally the 1930s. So um, I'm not I'm not what, sure what where he's. Say, yeah. What it, what I will say is that you do see demand for credit um, when it pertains to the foreign exchange market because when people want to invest in a certain country they tend to do so in the local currency or the strong currency, depending on what the country is, um, for instance, US dollar, um, because it's the money that you can use in the system, right? So like it, it, in the Western world, you would do it in the local country of whatever country you're investing in, because most of the banks will be operating in that currency. But then also you get exceptions with uh, a lot of third world countries, they tend to rely on the US dollar because their own currency isn't so reliable. And so that's where you do get demand for these sort of um, currencies and, and this sort of credit. But I don't know if that's specifically related to what he's saying. Um, well, I did want to very quickly just uh, channel Frank Shostak, who uh, hammered this into our <coughs> heads on Mises.org, uh, numerous articles on Mises.org, where his favorite phrase uh, is pool of real savings. Um, <coughs> and his point is that um, don't get too lost in all of this, this stuff about um, credit and all this. What it comes down to is that there's there's real things in the real economy, you know, people's time, uh, res you know, resources, material resources, land, so on and so forth. And you're either, um, you know, using them, uh, consuming them, or or you're uh, foregoing consumption, and you're allowing these real resources to be used for longer term plans for investment, right? Um, and uh, don't lose sight of that in the midst of all of the, you know, purposely, I would say purposely complicated mess that the modern uh, central banking system creates. Uh, it comes down to real resources. Are they uh, being used by the government? Are they being used by consumers? Or are they being uh, not used so that they're available for businesses to use to, you know, build a business to, to invest and, and um, uh, do something new with it. Uh, that's really what it all comes down to. And so a, a lot of this type of stuff, it seems like some kind of card trick to say that there can just be more resources magically somehow than there really are because we can borrow it from ourselves or because we can print money up or whatever. Um, uh, but just you can, in a way you can ignore all of that complicated business and just keep your eye on the ball of the real resources. Uh, where are the real resources being used? Is, is this action actually creating more real resources or is it just um, redistributing them from one place to another place, right? But I, I, I wanna say that his Direction of causation is not necessarily the way round we would have it, because if you if you if you have a look at what he's saying, he's saying businesses demand credit. This um uh you know for various different things they want to pay for labor, they want to pay for uh, factor inputs, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, then this results in increases in the broad money supply. Um, bank banks then demand more for reserves. Uh, when they need to clear obligations and the central bank creates the need of reserves. So that there's the direction of, uh, of, of causation. Whereas I, I want to say that we would always say, well, actually there's an artificially low interest rate, which creates an artificial mm -hmm. demand for cheap credit. Um, so, so essentially people are getting this easy money because they can, um, Mm -hmm. And right. and this and this creates uh, systematic malinvestments as as as, uh, yep. as Mises puts it. So yeah, uh, it's I, malinvestment I, I, and it yeah. savings. Uh, yes, oh, I so, see. So I, I think I follow your point, which is, 
if you lower the interest rate and suddenly a bunch of people want to borrow at that lower interest rate, then suddenly you go, see demand. Well, <laughs> sure. Well, if so, you start uh, giving stuff away, people will take it. But yeah, that doesn't really come, prove anything. To, to come back to your point, if it, if you're if you're focusing on real resources, i.e., available resources, not not ones kind of created out of thin air right. or sh or shadow money created by fractional reserve banking and, and and credit expansion, okay, but actual real savings, you know, actual actual um, resources. Mm -hmm. that, that that banks or, or investors may have uh, put into the pool, then what you'd see is a much higher interest rate, uh, you know, r rather than 0.1% or 0.3% or whatever it's been, like 50, like more like we saw in the 80s, right? 15%, 20%. Mm -hmm. and, and, and when the interest rate is 15 or 20%, you may see that demand for credit go down somewhat. Right. And you and you may see yeah. this credit tree expansion. You know, you wouldn't get a credit tree expansion. You get only those people who were really sure that they want this money, and they were really sure they could pay it back. Mm -hmm. So, so do, do, do you see how I think he's got the direction of causation a little bit? You know, he's he, he's a little missing a step there, which mm -hmm. we would put in, which is right. you know, yeah. who's controlling the interest rate? Right. Okay. Um, and then he's got this uh, thing about. You know, there are basically inflation, by which he means a, a change in the general price level. It's highly complex, the result of many factors, not a simple function of money supply. Businesses will raise their prices for all sorts of reasons, independently of money supply expansion. Now, it's true that businesses will change their change their prices, but they won't all do it in the same direction. You know the milk industry and the and the and the eggs industry and the bloody uh, burger industry and the car industry maybe aren't all facing identical conditions. They won't all move their prices, and some might move them down, and others might move them up. The the idea that they're all going to go up in the same direction, I think, can only come as a function of the money supply. Do, do you do you guys agree with me there, or or do you disagree? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's a little confusing, right? Because let's say there's none of this manipulation. And there's just the natural changes of prices responding to, mm -hmm. um, you know, the changes in the economy and so forth. I guess, depending on how you measure it, the general price level could not exactly, you know, like, uh, you know, this goes up, this goes down. Maybe it doesn't completely balance out. I mean, this is where the the whole notion of a general price level gets confusing, right? Um, like, how do you even, is a general price level even a thing? that is actionable you know is it is it a real thing or is it a statistical uh, uh theoretical thing. yeah but you, you, but you just cannot have all all prices moving in the same direction mm -hmm. in, in in a natural market um you know yeah, really sure. re right. I mean, how, how how could you because of the yeah. exchange rate because of the exchange ratios and also because of very simple things like substitution goods like um you know the classic example is tea and coffee right if, if the if the price of coffee goes up too high, people switch to tea, and, and vice and vice versa. So so right. the, so the so the two things the two things actually co counteract each other. So they can't both go in the same direction at the same time. Well, let's be careful. Uh, you know, as you pointed out, with Aztec Gold or the California Gold Rush or whatever. Um, no, no, but but, but, but that that's the general that's price of prices. But it was monetary. It was because of monetary inflation. Right, right, and that's what I'm saying. You're only going to get them all moving in the same direction if there's been some change in the money supply. Right. And in, in fact, the, the best the best book on this um, is actually Hayek's Prices and Production, where mm. he actually does this mental experiment where he says, "Look, just imagine that the just imagine the money supply is completely fixed. What would happen?" And he and he and he and he show and and in fact, what you'd happen is that you, you'd actually get a general tendency towards deflation. Uh, at the consumer price level, because more is being spent on on the, the higher factors of production, you know, on the tier one, tier two production levels. So as more is spent there, less is spent in the consumer thing. So prices are going to come down at the consumer level. But of course, prices will have gone up somewhere else, uh, up, you know, higher up the supply chain, something like this. But um, mm. he shows what would happen if you had a completely fixed money supply in 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 that book. Um, so I don't, um, I don't, uh, I don't really accept there can be general price inflation, you know, coming not from not from money supply. But he oh. says, look, what about the what about the cost push phenomenon? He says that 
um, so one way it can happen is this. He says, workers or unions demand higher wages and businesses agree to these increases and or prices of other factor inputs rise and then businesses will need to obtain higher levels of credit from banks. So what do we think of this? It's the just such an oversimplification of things, isn't it? Because, I mean, not only are there plenty of other factors that will influence prices, um, there's also, as we've established, the fact that prices aren't going to all go in the same direction. It's such an oversimplification. Well, I mean, there's other things. So uh, unions demanding higher wages and businesses agree to them. Of course, what's that going to result in to come back to WH Hutt or, uh, or Hayek? Unemployment. If, if, if businesses are agreeing to uh, wage increases, presumably in time, they're going to start laying off some staff or reducing their hours or something like this. So I, mm. I don't I don't know if that's, um, you know, that's that's not going to cause a general price inflation, because if you've got now three extra people are unemployed, well, they still need to eat as well. Right. But they've got massively reduced income. Um, and then the other thing is, he says, uh, prices of other factor inputs rise um, and then businesses will need to obtain higher levels of credit from banks. Yeah, but it's not they're not going to rise across the entire economy, are they? They might rise in one industry, but not in another industry. Yeah, I, I have to say I'm I'm very confused about how this has to do with a general price inflation. Maybe we would need to clarify what well, I'm, by a general I'm afraid. I'm afraid again and be, again. These would be industry specific or whatever, right? It just it just comes down to not getting Say's law. It, 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 I, I don't know how many times yeah. I have to, this thing about the exchange ratios, this thing about the, the the fact that you can't have everything moving in the same direction at the same time. Because because resources are finite, right? Because mm -hmm. if you if you are using this land to plant an apple orchard, you're not using it to build a car factory. You know all of this sort of stuff. It, it, you know all this way of explaining things doesn't take any of that into account. So you can't you can't get it's everything right. moving in the same direction because some things come at the cost of other things, right? Am I wrong? It's that whole attitude that you can somehow program the entire economy on your computer, right? It's this almost arrogance, I'd say, that the economy is much more simple than it is, and it's easy to predict. We know this isn't the case, right? <laughs> We've proven this time and time and time again. So uh, yeah, so 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 then he uh, then he then he just uh, has some links, and then now he gets onto W H Hutt. Was there anything in this final section worth picking up on? Do we think? Because he's talking about, he's <clears throat> saying, um, he's saying that uh, um, Hutt's attack on full employment was a straw man. Um, I mean, right. I can read so, what he says. So, he says, so, go ahead. I'll just read what he says, and then you can then you can respond, Radlib. He says, um, academic agent cites the work of W. Uh, William H. Hutt, who is one of the most ignorant and stupid critics of Keynesianism ever produced by libertarianism. One of the most ignorant and stupid critics of Keynesianism. And I've got a number of books by Hutt here. He's got a great book called A, a, Re, um, a Rehabilitation of Say's Law. Mm. He's, got, he's got another really good book uh, mm. uh, here about um, uh, how union, it's called The Economics of the Color Bar. Um, and he's got another one on unions and unemployment. Um, and all of them have Keynes squarely in their sights. I, th I actually think he's one of the sharpest critics of Keynes. Um, probably the only other person who's really sharp is, uh, is Henry Haslow. Um, um, I, I, I'd like to mention on economics of the color bar, if I understand correctly, and I have not read Hutt, you've read Hutt, um, he really goes full blast against um, the uh, apartheid uh, way, yeah, way, I, way before it was cool, like decades before anyone had heard of it or it became a big cause celebration. Yeah, Hutt was well, but, blasting, blasting away at it. He showed well. He showed, he shows that the uh, apartheid really started with um, trade union protectionism, much right. like uh, much like the Jim Crow laws in America. Re really, it was a protection of white workers. Right. Except the fun part is it was like socialist labor unions, ultimately yeah, yeah. pushing yeah. for what were yeah. racist policies. Right. Yeah. I mean, but well, most most racism started with the trade union, like most of those sorts of kind of economic economic racism, 
like the right, the minimum wage in New York was because of the Southern blacks coming up there, and that's how we began to see the minimum wage in the United States, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cre creative creative ways, I guess, of of, of stopping uh, uh, other races coming in. But, yeah. but, but anyway, he says. Yeah, um, yeah. <clears throat> Hutt's criticism of Keynes and Keynesian concepts are often ridiculous straw man misrepresentations. To take one example, the concept of full employment was never meant to include uh, normal frictional, frictional and seasonal unemployment as a problem to be ended. Full employment does not mean a 0% unemployment rate and never did. This is completely absurd. Rather, frictional and seasonal unemployment are also are, are always going to happen and full employment actually means persistent involuntary unemployment. In a modern capitalist economy, full employment has often been estimated to be below a 4% unemployment rate. Academic agents' entire attack on full employment based on HUT is a ludicrous parody and not to be taken seriously. All in all, academic agent fails to refute MMT and reveals the profound flaws in Austrian economics. <laughs> so, any any thoughts on this? Because you wanted so, to give him, you wanted to kind of give him the benefit of the doubt here. Well, because I'm not a Keynes scholar, so I don't know. Maybe that's right that Keynes or the Keynesians or both. I don't know. Um, have a reasonable idea of what they mean by full employment, which would include, you know, understand. And and, and I'm sorry, just to make sure listeners don't feel like we're missing a step. When we talk about frictional seasonal unemployment, we expect that in a, an economy that isn't static, um, some, come, some firms are going to fail, other firms are going to um, start up, um, people are just going to do different things in their life at different times and so forth. And so there will be periods of where you're not, you know, maybe you don't count in the unemployment statistics, uh, depending on how the government does that, but you're not employed. You know, you're of employable age and for whatever reason, you're not employed. We expect this. Even in the most, you know, Shangri-La and Kapistan scenario, we expect that some people will not be employed at certain points because they're shifting from one industry to another, from a, one job to another, uh, yeah. whatever, changes in the economy. So he's just saying that's a reasonable definition of full employment. I would agree. That's a reasonable definition. I have no problem with it. And I just can't say whether Keynes really was taking the 0% unemployment line. Um, I'm sorry. Did you think he he did? Eh? Um, well, I, th I think he's got in mind. So, so for example, um, Hutt in his in in the stuff I quoted says um, basically like, what about an engineer who's out of work? Um, you know, would he really be better just to get any old job working in a grocery store, or is this engineer uh, b better off being out of work for a few months while he tries to find something that's going to make you know an efficient like um, make use of his skills essentially um but really what what hut does um in a lot of that stuff is he quibbles with a lot of things like um so the idea of full employment is you know all every resource in the economy is efficiently used and Hutt's saying well what does that really mean who's to say what's efficient who's to say what is being used efficiently you know is is it like is it an efficient use of this engineer's time to uh, work at the grocery store so that he's not unemployed or is it, or is he better off spending three or four months out of work until a job for an engineer comes along uh, this sort of thing um, so maybe Keynes is a Keynes is kind of justified in that um, but the re the reason I brought this the reason I brought this up is because of the uh, earlier quotation from forget the guy's name now Randall was it um, who said uh, let me just see if I can find the quotation um, L Randall Ray um, at full employment except for imports the economy's resources are all used according to Randall Ray any further spending will be inflationary at full employment the government is in direct competition with the private sector he says and if mm. the private sector can match you but you get into a bidding war blah 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 because this is their explanation for inflation um and the reason i the reason i quoted uh hutt's attack on full employment is is not own is not just this idea that it's not you know it's a, it's a it's not percent it's the idea that central planners or anybody should have quote unquote full employment whether it's naught percent or four percent or whatever you want to define it as as a goal for the economy 
the economy yeah. does not have the, the economy does not have the goal of full employment it doesn't it, yeah, it, there's it, a specific term the the keynesians use that begins with an s but it's really annoying because i can't remember what it is um but it's 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 that basically uh, i'll try and remember it so 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 that was that was really what i was trying to get at this like this idea that the that the function of an economy is to give people jobs no the fu- no it, 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 if anything the re- the reason any the reason the job exists is because people want some other product right so um i don't know like uh, people want flour so somebody has to work at the flour mill and as long as that's the case somebody has to be a flour miller and that's a, and that's an opportunity for you to get a job but the flour mill does not exist to give you a job it exists to make flour Mm-hmm. And if if the flour mill can work more efficiently, um, employing one person as opposed to ten, then it then those nine people who would have been employed in the in the flour mill are much are much better off doing something else, right? Because it's it's it, you know more efficient quote unquote to, to to do it with the with the uh, you know windmill two thousand super flour maker or whatever it is. So you know. The idea, the idea that the more people who are the more people who are employed, the better, even if we get them digging ditches or building bridges or whatever else, is not really the point of an economy. The point of an economy is to give us goods and services that people want at affordable price points, right? Not just to supply jobs. It's just the wrong. It's the wrong way round of looking at the economy. Yeah, um, it, it is interesting. Full employment is a term I only know. Uh, in economic reasoning from Keynesians, I think. I, I don't think Austrians just, we just don't even think like that is is what you're getting at, right? Um, and uh, whereas whereas I, I think Jack was helping us get, get at this a little bit, I, I'd love for you to explain it better. Full employment becomes key for them because um, they think it helps explain like inflation and competition between the private and public sector and various things, right? Yeah, well, they they think some Keynesians, this is the issue, is there's so many different Keynesians with yeah. different views on things. Right. But some Keynesians think that the amount of resources not being used in an economy, uh, and this is slack, the term that they use, uh, mm. is what determines inflation. Mm. And so as a result, you can see how they make the link between full employment and uh, inflation there. So uh, any, anyway, I mean, see, this is this is why I was so reluctant to get into this, because our starting principles are so far away from theirs. What right. we're trying to do, how right. we understand everything, it's so far away that, that we almost are speaking two different languages, right? Mm-hmm. To, to, to them, this is some like simulation game, right? Where they're trying to, they're trying to like, they're trying to maximize total amount of jobs, and mm-hmm. they're trying to stabilize prices as a goal. That's something else Keynesians always want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, they're trying to build this kind of safe, perfect, e- like what Mises would call an evenly rotating economy that never changes. Right? You're never, you're never going to get this because the world changed. I mean. Mises points this out so often. He says, "Listen, the world changes. What you, what your, what your government is planning to um, that big government project that's going to take five years to do. By the time it's up and running, and you've got everything, maybe everything's moved on, right? Maybe, maybe this is um, what's the, what's the, what's the phrase? Maybe you're just building a, like a, a chocolate gherkin factory, right? Nobody wants chocolate gherkins now, and this is the problem the Soviets had." They were constantly pouring resources into stuff that nobody wanted. It's yeah, and all... fundamentally, it's taking resources away from elsewhere in the economy where the market could have more efficiently used them. But 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 we justified this because, comrade, um, I had you, I had you building, uh, I had you making chocolate gherkins in Siberia, and you got paid, and you had a job. So why, why are you complaining? I mean, that's the that's the way they look at it, really. So it's it's yeah. it's um it I don't know it's just the wrong way round of thinking of it. We we always think well what do people want, and everything else flows from there. You know it's the consumer good, um that re- that really that really matters. Like 
all other product, all other things are in the service of making a consumer good. Um, right, and and I would just say in regards to employment levels, uh, as you said, it, it, I guess the way I would think about it from an Austrian point of view is that that's something we couldn't really say much about a priori, right? We we the market would have to discover what the ideal employment level is or whatever, right? Based on some people's willingness to work for certain wages or willingness to not work because they just don't want to work for those wages, yeah. right? No. Uh, combined with, you know, the demands for goods, which result in demands for workers, all of this would interplay and result in some kind of employment level, but we wouldn't be able to just look at it in, in a truly free market we wouldn't have any outside perspective from which to judge the employment level and say there's something wrong with that. It would just be something the market would discover and we'd go, well, there you go. That's that's the amount yeah. of people who want to be employed or the market economy, the economy I, wants to use. You know, I, I do. I do want to say, though, that that Hutt and Rothbard don't entirely agree on this because Hutt uh, seems to say that there will always be some unemployment, you know, maybe it's people between jobs or whatever else. Mm -hmm. Where, whereas Rothbard in a number of places says, actually, in a totally free market, there's no such thing as involuntary, involuntary unemployment because you'll hit a price level where somebody's willing to work eventually, basically. So so basically, he redefines it and says, well, if somebody's, if somebody's unemployed, what they're saying is, I want to work in this place you know, on these wages, doing this job, um, and and in fact, uh, on the free market, this this, you know, if if they were still un unemployed, they'd be voluntary unemployed, not involuntary unemployed. Because if you if push comes to shove, you take a job at a dollar an hour. That's that's basically Rothbard's argument. So it's kind of like a, a little bit nitpicky, but yeah, yeah. Uh, he he seems to suggest that on on a free market there would be no. Uh, involuntary unemployment. I'm not sure if I agree I, with him. I, well, yeah, and I, I, the way he defines it, there's really no disagreeing with him, right? Um, uh, he's basically saying in a free market, it, if you wanted to work and were willing to work for the wages that were being offered, then you could get a job, right? Um, yeah. But, but if, so Hatt is not disagreeing. He's just saying, actually, in some cases, like the engineer, for example, you may want to be voluntary unemployed for a while. You're not going to take the the job at McDonald's or the or the grocery store job because you're an engineer. Yeah, you're, right. waiting, you're, holding, you're holding out for an engineer job, ideally. Uh, that right? wouldn't that wouldn't count as involuntary unemployment. That would be voluntary, right? That, that is, would be. I would rather wait until I get an, a a job doing what I want to do, rather than take the jobs yeah. that are being offered, right? And I, I want to say even this. I mean. I don't know how much this happens, but doesn't even the state take that view? Like if you know, in this country, if you have unemployment benefit, you have to be seen looking for any any job, right? Any job, mm -hmm. um, whether it's McDonald's or or you know working at the grocery store or whatever else. It doesn't matter if I'm an engineer. I just have to be seen looking for anything to get the to get the benefit. So, um, yeah. All right. I don't know. I don't know if uh, if Jack is actually oh, Jack is still with us. He's um, he's just uh, dropped out a second. Probably um, worth uh, uh, doing the super chats now, unless there's anything else anybody wanted to add, because I've seen there's quite a few. <clears throat> and, no, no. Well, um, I think the super chats will give us lots of opportunities. Jack, did you want to do anything before we hit super chats? Yeah, we'll we'll go through the super chats. It, it, it depends how badly you guys want to go over some of the other arguments, because obviously there's loads of other arguments we haven't even touched on, you know. Um, okay, I mean, same I, MT. I guess we've covered quite a few of them. You know, stuff like, um, yeah, yeah, like the current accounts, for instance, I mentioned, or, you know, uh, the Austrian business cycle, or um, mm -hmm. the, the foreign exchange market, all these sorts of things. But, it, it, you know, it, like, I mean, we could go on all night talking about it. So it depends uh, whether the market demand is I, there for it. Th there, there was one other thing I wanted to mention very quickly as well, which is that um, I don't know if they were these were all like uh, advocates of modern monetary theory. But I had quite a few people like coming into my comments saying, like, you're a, you're a joke. You know, nobody in the economics profession would take what you're saying seriously and all this. Um, and they were clearly like. Just, just leftists, you know, name calling and things. And I just thought I'd like look, you know, what 
what are mainstream economists saying about this? And I thought this was very interesting. This was uh, this was a questionnaire at the Chicago uh, IGM forum, um, which is like a panel of all leading economists in the world. Um, countries that borrow in their own currency should not worry about government deficits because they can always create money to de- finance their debt. None of them agree. <laughs> Zero. Not a single one agreed. Yeah, um, no, I was commenting when you showed us this before the show that um, you you know as much as uh, some of us like to rail against the universities and 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 everything, even mainstream economists are are relatively sane. So, you know, so and, and as you see here, so when so when these people are calling me all these names, I mean, just remember, it, it, I mean, this is one issue where it you know it apart from AOC and a couple of other nutters. Bernie, nobody really is agreeing with it. Nobody really is yeah, agreeing with this MMT stuff. Right. Even Paul Krugman doesn't agree with it. So even Paul Krugman, and if you if you if you go down right, um, their responses, they actually. I mean, I didn't look at this when I was when I was doing my video, but it's it's funny. I mentioned Weimar Germany. He mentions Weimar Germany. Um, they're all mentioning inflation as the, as the as as one of the key problems. Mm, yeah, that's it, and that's why the neoclassical is rejected. It's because of inflation. So you know, I'm just saying we're not on our. This is one issue in which the Austrians and the um, and the mainstream are kind of united against it for largely the same reasons. Although there are a couple of little wrinkles. I'm not sure if these guys would talk about. Canting on effects the way the way we do, for example, um, but uh, largely they have inflation as the main the main concern. This guy this guy has said, look, ten. At some point the system just breaks down. I mean, this guy's this guy's in Yale. It's not exactly like some conservative bastion or anything, right? Exactly. Uh, yeah. So uh, so yeah, I, I would say the economics profession. Yeah, this guy is written. Friedman wrote a book. There's no such thing as a free lunch. He also meant road or bridge or army or school or anything. So there, so there we go. Um, yeah, there will come a point where the currency is so debased that further spending becomes difficult, if not impossible. At some mm. point, hyperinflation would break it apart. So there, that I means I didn't really push on the Zimbabwe or the. Mm-hmm. If you notice in my video, that wasn't actually part of my argument. Mm-hmm. I was just trying to show the extreme cases where money supply increase in the money supply cause inflation. Um, I, I showed other examples too, but these guys are basically just saying this would happen. They just think it would be Zimbabwe. So um, yeah, I, I would. I, even, I, I think um, in these circumstances that would likely happen. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know specifically, but my interpretation is that in these like the, the the specific cases where you have massive hyperinflation, it's more because of obviously they're printing the money, but also it's the recognition that it's in an international system. And so as soon as people begin to lose confidence in this money that's being printed, which will happen pretty quickly, um, they're all going to start investing their money in foreign currency. Um, and so as a result, the, the central bank or the government or whoever it is who has to be in charge of it in this specific country is going to panic and print even more and so it becomes exponential in a sense yeah and i still i still i mean my my uh problem and i still would love a uh, someone an, an mmt to explain this how do they get the money if they're gonna pay for all this like they like qe how are they getting that money from m3 to m1 i don't understand how they can like they don't explain that part because to me and to most people, that's why QE wasn't inflationary. Um, but of course, you know, of course, they don't think it was a result in inflation, as we've talked about. Anyway, let's uh, let's. Um... Well, I mean, uh, um, obviously, I don't agree with MMT. But if I were to try and uh, counter the argument from their perspective, I'd say that they're not interested in getting it to, into M1. Uh, they'd print the money and then they'd keep it within the system purely to pay for what the government needs to pay. But how can, um, they, how can it not get to M1 when they're paying wages? They're paying wages of government employees. Well, you'd say that eventually it would uh, filter down, although they did say they want to pay for government employees and things through taxes. Um, but 
their idea is it like this stuff doesn't matter to them. All that matters to them is that they're going to be able to issue their public works project and they don't have to borrow for it. They don't have to raise taxes for it because they can just magically print money. That's all that matters to them. I mean, let's let's be honest. This is this is just old. But as I said in my video, this is just yet another new economics. This is just what the left do every once in a while. Every 10 years or so, oh, we've got this new way of doing economics. Right. It, it, it involves us planning everything. It involves <laughs> us being in charge. And it involves somehow us getting stuff for free. Yeah. But they, I mean, it, it doesn't matter what you call it. It's just, it's just the same old rubbish again and again. Right. Redistrib anyway, let, let's, uh, let's have a look at the, um, let's have a look at the super chats. Um, I, I do like though how they how they try to play this trick with with like um, look we're trying to give you savings so conservatives can't dislike this. That's one of the, this is a kind of tricky little tricky little thing that they've tried to come up with there. Uh, anyway, let's have a look at the super chats. So, well, there's been quite a few. Uh, uh, wow, I was there. Shell Discord. Okay, uh, join the Discord. Um, like I mentioned earlier, you'll get through to the holding bay. And then you may graduate to the deep law. Charlemagne says MMT money just ain't what it used to be. <laughs> uh, Aquila Voiter says MMT magic money tree. <laughs> I mean, I, I I guess we're about to see a little bit of MMT in action with Corona. I mean, who who the hell knows what's going to happen with that? All right. Especially in America, they've just given it, what every single American got a grand. Yeah, but that's uh, uh, chump change compared to everything they're putting into, like, you know, bank reserves and stuff. Yeah, of course. Yeah, It's, it's just crazy. Reserve requirements are at zero. Did you hear that, AA? God. Um, <laughs> I mean, who, who, who knows? I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm wondering if they're just going to just draw a line under it and say, listen, let's just start again. <laughs> like, like, just start, like, forget all debt, forget all debts ever. We'll get China. We'll just blow up China to pay for it. I reckon they'll do that. <laughs> right. All right. That's that's probably why they they're gonna they're gunning for a war with China, and they'll be like, right, China's got a lot of stuff. We'll just pay for it. China, who are currently selling off a bunch of U.S. Uh, foreign currency reserves. Ah. Uh, what I mean, it, am I wrong though? I could see that play already. I'd be like, yeah, we'll just get China pay pay for it. Right. I reckon they're, I reckon they're thinking that already. Um, certainly some people are openly saying it aren't they but it's yeah. kind of not serious when these people say it on Twitter and stuff I mean I mean, if I was a neocon that's what I'd be thinking right well, yeah yeah it fits with their idea what geopolitical reasoning can be made for using MMT uh, not sure I'm a much of enough of a geopol guy that would be a uh, mad mm -hmm. mercenaries department I don't know what it would mean. it would be extremely harmful from a geopolitical perspective because as I say it would generate a trade deficit and so you would be putting um, your industrial base in a foreign country in the long why run. Does, why does it generate a trade deficit? Uh, it's from the deficit spending side um, so like the the macro formula for it is that GDP is made up of consumption plus investment plus government expenditure yes. plus net exports. Uh, yeah. And savings are made up of GDP minus consumption minus government expenditure. And so from this, we can figure out that net exports are affected by savings minus investment, right? And so when it comes to budget deficits, if you increase your budget deficit, you reduce your savings, basically because easier access to credit um, lowers interest rates, right? Lower interest rates means that there's less incentive to save. Less incentive to save means that you get upward pressure on interest rates. So it kind of tries to balance itself out, which increases capital inflows, which leads to currency appreciation, which is for the reasons I kind of hinted at earlier, where I say that when people invest in a country, they tend to do so in the local currency. Mm -hmm. And so you get currency appreciation. And of course, as currencies appreciate um, with the Marshall Lerner condition, you get um, uh, exports becoming more expensive and imports becoming cheaper. And so what you get by maintaining a budget deficit, you also get a trade deficit. You also get a current account deficit. 
uh, in the long run. And of course, the, the reason why I link this to MMT is because like, part of their aim is to reduce unemployment. But if you are increasing your trade deficit, then you're decreasing your aggregate demand, which affects unemployment. It increases unemployment. Or at the very least, it decreases employment. So, yeah, but I, I mean, you're you're just, just to so I understand that. Are you imagining like let's just pretend it was Britain who was doing MMT? Okay, are you imagining that Britain doing MMT would result in a stronger pound? In I mean, the you... long run, yes. Uh, but mm. th this is assuming they allow interest rates to rise as there is um, an influx of investment from abroad. Which you would what? see because, um, do you want me to give you the name of the theory if anyone wants to research it but, uh, how, later? Wait, it's called why the would, deficit hypothesis. Why would um, why would foreign? I mean, a, a foreign a foreign investors just thinking um, Britain's going to spend a load of money here because they're printing it. I mean, what, why 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 is it attracting foreign investment? It's almost a reliance on foreign investment. This is the thing. It ultimately goes two ways, depending on interest rates. Um, because either interest rates stay low, in which case you get the situation I explained would likely like, likely did happen with Zimbabwe and so on, where people start abandoning the currency and the reverse happens. And this is a, this is, is a loss of confidence, which leads to exponential uh, capital growth. But if this doesn't happen, right, which the Keynesians would say it doesn't, then yeah. you will get a trade deficit because it means that interest rates must rise eventually, which would uh, result in people investing in the country because there's obviously higher interest rates. So it's all down to the interest rates, basically, Wh whether or not they stay low or, or suddenly rise. I'd be interested to see uh, what Lord Keynes responds to that, um, if he does. Uh, Keynesians don't think the economy be, be like it is, but it do. Aust Austrian econ man. Charlemagne says that. <laughs> Doug Nemitz says um, the paper has markings on it which indicates its value, material culture. <laughs> um, Walter the Einstein Frog says I'm convinced that no one genuinely believes in NMT and it's just socialists attempting 4D chess. Well, 4D chess. I mean, I, it's like what you were saying. I, I, I actually was pretty sympathetic to that comment when I saw it. Um, the these things are not like deep intellectual uh, um, developments, right? That there's these fads that come through. It becomes an excuse to do what they wanted to do anyway. Mm. And when it sort of falls apart, gets critiqued in the academy, and so on and so forth, they just drop it and pick up another one. Um, I mean, right? What what one thing I'll say is that. Um, Keynes did not actually deal with the biggest criticism I made in my video, which is that when you're messing around with the GDP formula in that way, and then saying that because you've done some algebra based on an equation that you made up, um, this has explanatory power of what's going to go on in the economy. I think that's madness. I think it just, I don't think the formula explains anything. I don't think it has any, there is no causal effect between um government uh government spending and private saving it it doesn't just because just because you organize the gdp formula in that way doesn't mean that there is an actual causal relationship between those two things um and this is why I, you know another way of talking about austrian economics is to call it causal realism and that's because we're piece by piece from the bottom up trying to um isolate causal factors well i mean the the these these things in the uh, GDP equation are not causal factors. It's just an equation. So, and, and Keynes, as I thought he wouldn't, didn't pick up on that. That was my number one point, really. Um, it doesn't explain anything. And, and uh, I saw Robert, I used Ro uh, Robert Murphy's piece that you can find on Mises.org. He, he said, listen, you could literally re replace the G in that formula with Google and the logic of the thing would stay the same. Only instead of government spending, it's now Google spending. It makes no it makes it just it's just nonsense. Did, there was a wanna... meme going around on Twitter that um, it it was something like uh, it was a Keynesian looking at a book, um, and they were complaining that they couldn't understand it because there weren't any pictures. 
<laughs> it was it, the book was human action, but anyway. So, um, so, 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 yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd recommend looking at that Robert Murphy piece as well, where he's where he basically just does it all again, but with Google spending, and shows that basically because it's all just based on this formal maths, it, it all just works. Because it, what difference does it make? What the G stands for? Mm. It's, right. Um, so uh, you could plug any numbers in there. Doesn't doesn't make any because it has no relation whatsoever to the real world. I mean, I, I don't know if you guys agree with me or not, but I, I just think it has nothing to do with economics whatsoever. This this equation. Yeah. Well, it, um, it, it should be that the equations serve uh, the economic theory rather than the other way around. Yeah, but but don't forget the the GDP the GDP form. Doesn't actually explain anything. So yeah. um, it's just it's just a way of deriving this number they call GDP, and now, and now we're going to go back through that formula and use it to explain like real men and women and how they're saving and stuff. It's just, just nonsense. Yeah. Um, Silly Sailor says, uh, "How can they call this Keynesianism? Even Keynes believe you should run surpluses in good times. MMT is so moronic. I'm defending Keynes helicopter." <laughs> <laughs> um yeah yeah um, sorry. It's, it's they i i guess they only call it keynesianism because the people who came up with the theory were like a heterodox branch of keynesianism but that's about as far as the links go and also it comes down to the central premise of keynesianism which is that you know investing in public works and such during times of recession is the best thing to do yeah no, i'm i'm a lot less keen on being uh, as charitable to Keynes as a lot of people. A lot of people are like, oh, Keynesians are bad, but Kane, Keynes himself, you know, you let him off the hook. Oh, I, nice. I, 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 I disagree. I, I think that, um, you know, yeah, in theory, you know, the markets work, except when they don't, and they don't work when I say so, all the time, basically. I mean, when is the time where he's meant to be this liberal? Doesn't happen. Never happens at any time. Oh, oh just so, you know, it, it's, um, I don't, uh, I don't um, believe the, the, this kind of idea that Keynes the guy was good, but Keynesianism is bad. Keynes the guy was bad too, yep. um, so. in my view. So um, MMT just shows how America is so disconnected to the laws of economics because of the reserve status in the US military. Argentina has tried doing MMT and has always regretted it. Ha ha ha, Hispaniad. <laughs> that, was, that was from I I Guerrero de Jalesco too. Yeah, I mean, that's another thing that we didn't really talk about, but they they assume that, like, they say, well, it's all well and good talking about Zimbabwe and Venezuela and all these bullshit countries, but let's face it, a country like the UK or a country, especially a country like the USA, that's never going to default. It's just never going to default on, on its debts. It can print forever. And the Fed have said this as well. Was it Bernanke who said it? Or um, who, was the, who was the previous one? Uh, Greenspan? Who was the guy? Greenspan uh, was, it, was it Greenspan who said it, or, or Volcker? It was it was one of, it was one of these guys. Oh, who basically... here we go. Hey, I happen to be looking at the quote. It's at the top of the MMT Wikipedia article. The United States can pay any debt it has because we can always print money to do that. So there is zero probability of default. Fed Chair Alan Greenspan. So so there we go. And they they rely on those statements by the Fed. But I'm like, is this true? Like, just because a guy from the Fed said it, does it mean it's true? Right. Does it? Can, can the US <laughs> never default on its debts? Yeah. The Titanic couldn't be sunk, right? It's that kind of thing. Um, Dilla98 says, thoughts on contra bonds. It seems like fiscal union. Sorry, thoughts on corona bonds. Corona bonds. It seems bond. like f fiscal union. What are corona bonds? Do you know what he's referring to here? I think he's talking about um, the European what they're calling corona bonds in europe mm. this is um this is the european central bank issuing bonds um uh to help the likes of italy and spain out but my understanding mm. is that they had a big meeting the other day in which they decided they weren't going to be doing that oh. and and uh instead they're going to do it like they did with greece uh, i.e italy and spain are going to be in debt to germany for the next 10, 20 years. <laughs> they, they, so they're going to do it through loans. <laughs> um, uh, which, and if they do that, which it looks like they're going to, because it was Emmanuel Macron who wanted the, the 
uh, the the euro bonds and angela merkel was like no i want to do it like i want to do it according to our existing rules like we did with greece if they come out of this and force spain and italy to pay for this through loans from germany that's probably the end of the eu i, I would say if if they mm. if they go that route if they do to italy what they did to greece and, and to spain that's that's it you can't was well, it italy is the third biggest country and Sp spain can't be that far behind i can't uh, i can't see the eu surviving that personally but uh, if that's what you're talking about dylan 98 I, I could be wrong um bob dole says i heard from insiders that the banks are in panic mode because millions are defaulting on their loans time to buy gold or prepare for a bank run uh, uh, yeah well there there's there was an insane amount of uh clos in the system prior to this uh prior to the crisis the clos being collateralized loan obligations and mm. um, so obviously the mortgage is collapsed uh in 2008 but it became suddenly very trendy to then switch over to clos uh, and so we've seen a huge amount of corporate debt come up through this area. Um, but it was really beginning to strain. And obviously, it's been kind of famous that we that there have been a lot of companies that are in junk, uh, in, in triple, sorry, just one above junk in, in triple B credit ratings with all this debt. Um, it's so like this was something that the banks were really panicking about. And then on top of this, the coronavirus hits. Uh, so, yeah, I, I'd imagine they are panicking. Uh, it's probably why there's such drastic measures being taken by the central banks. It's uh, it's it's very tricky. Um, if you have a look at how the the Great Depression started, um, i.e., how it turned from the Wall Street crash into the actual Great Depression, it all started when farmers uh, were defaulting on their on their mortgages, which basically mm. brought the entire system down. Um, and if that happens, I don't know. This is why this is why I'm wondering whether we might see something insane, i.e., we're just going to start again. We have fucked this up so much; it's just going to start again. We're going to clean mm. all debt, something like this. I wouldn't be surprised because we're—I don't know—it's such a mess at the moment. Um, I can't see them, except like this is going to sound ridiculous. I cannot see them accepting another Great Depression, and we're set up for one. I think. I mean, it, it, Stephen, do you have any uh, different view on this? I, f I, f I feel like we are set up for one. It, it seems like magic would need to happen to not have. I mean, I, my understanding is lots of small businesses are insolvent at this point, right? But I mean, they're doing these mortgage holidays. And I guess right. what they're thinking is like, well, Look at these banks. Pause, where we press we press the pause button on everything and then yeah. we'll just everybody at once, okay, go back to like you were and just forget that the last few months happened. Like don't charge each other for it. Just just roll right on. Maybe yeah. it'll work. <laughs> who, who knows? And if it doesn't, they'll just they'll just bail the banks out again, right? Mm -hmm. no? I'm making a really uh I'm I'm very purposely uh blaming almost everything that's happening right now on the stimulus packages that came in 2009 i think that we can link almost everything that's occurring right now to then rather than the virus because every, if everything does go wrong everyone will blame the virus and so i'm trying to really kind of promote this idea that we need to look beyond that because mm -hmm. it's like if, if people had savings or an appropriate level of savings then we could handle this stuff so much better but they don't. It's because of all the low interest rates that there have been. Yeah. It's because of all the debt that's in the system, because of the low interest rates, because of the quantitative easing. Um, and so, yeah. Yeah, I, I was thinking about this. Do you, do you remember um, in my in my book, um, uh, Rad Lib, um, how I've got that table looking at net national savings, um, ha and I and I showed that in the Victorian era you know decade on decade they kept about 10 percent back for net national savings so they had a slower rate of growth in the victorian era but a very steady healthy rate of growth right. um but it was slowed down a little bit because they they were so conscious about saving mm -hmm. and um that number that 10 percent number obviously takes a massive hit in the world uh in this in the second world war 
where uh, it went into you know minus three point five for a while, but then it's reasonably it's reasonably healthy until you hit like the nineteen nineties and the Tony Blair era, mm. and um, and now it's what was it naught point one percent naught point naught one percent. Basically, there are no savings. Yeah, and, 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 and yeah. And when I was compiling that table, I was thinking, God, what what if something happens? What yeah. if there was a world? What if there was a world war now? There is no, there are no savings. Yeah. And and guess what? The big the big event did happen. So, right. God knows. I mean, I, honestly, God knows. Um, Things are very fragile. Yeah. Um, but I I agree, Jack, that it's uh you know it's all the it's all the stuff Taleb was talking about in that anti fragile book. Um. Uh, okay. Uh. D D DRT is king says the Inca empire didn't have money and was a pure command economy. Uh, was that true communism? I would have to look into the workings of the Inca I empire. Know I know uh, that uh, command economies were very fashionable in the bronze age. Um, they weren't very efficient and eventually they collapsed. Yeah. Um, and and I mean let's let, let's face it they they didn't do very well did they when 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 another power came in so um, uh, Doug Nemitz says um, twenty pounds he says a chat I was having with Matthias last night I said to him that I think Menga has missed out material culture in his analysis on the basis of money coming into being not a criticism just something I noticed thoughts um, I uh, I don't know really know what you mean by material culture. One thing I do know is that um, I have never been able to truly understand how money comes into the system in the first place, whether it's um, through a purely private system. I cannot conceptualize it, i.e. I don't know what the mechanism is from getting the money from the gold mine into the real economy. Um, that's something. Yeah, that's something I've never been able to quite uh, quite work out in my own theorization. In fact, um, Steve and I had a, I had a very long conversation with uh, um, Holzman. Mm -hmm. um, Guido. Yeah, G Guido. Um, I, I think I was with him for over an hour, and I still I still really couldn't get my head around it. So mm. that's that's a bit of it that I just can't conceptualize. How does how does demand for money arise? And how does that demand for money translate into actual money getting into real people's hands from a gold mine? I, I can't figure it out. Hmm. Well, we'll have to discuss it later. I, that is one of the other books I edited, by the way, was Guido's book on money. That's a fantastic, The Ethics of Money Production? Yeah, that's right. I was the copy editor for that, just like for your book. Superb, superb book. Um, yeah. Ru, Ru Mu, for, but, apart, but apart from that one bit, because uh, about how how it gets into the system, but anyway, we're <laughs> running late. Uh, Ru Mu forty two says, uh, at this point, the governments and banks should just embrace the joke and print monopoly money. At least they wouldn't <laughs> be trying to hide the truth. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much, um, Dan now, Howard. To be fair, yeah. Joe, Joe Salerno always emphasizes that he he rejects the people who say um, it's not really money. You know, Federal Reserve notes are not really money. Only gold is really money. It's like, well, I know what you mean, but no. I mean, when it comes down to it, as economists, we must say that the medium of exchange right now in the United States, for example, are those Federal Reserve notes. They are functioning as money. And we can understand why through the regression theorem and so on and so forth. And it doesn't prove that you're more hardcore or more of a gold bug for you to declare that it's not money. It just shows that you don't you don't understand what's going on, you know? <laughs> Yeah, no, I, 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 I tend to agree. Um, although I had, I did when we went to New York, there were a few papers. There was a lot of animated discussion around Bitcoin and the and the and the regression theorem. And right. Somebody was trying. Somebody was trying to argue that actually you can get to real money through the regression theorem. Use it like even with Bitcoin. Whereas um, I seem to remember Salerno and a few other guys there were like pretty hardcore no. Mm. The Bitcoin, Bitcoin can't be real money, so that's that's been a long-standing split, I think, um, in some of those circles, right? So yeah. Oh, I remember debating when Bitcoin was first around. Goodness, how how many years ago was that? I mean, this was you know within a couple of, a year or two of Bitcoin being a thing. They were debating it at the Mises Institute. 
Dan Howard says, could any of you do book reviews on Goliath, Curse of Bigness, or that book uh, by Mark Blythe? Doing some book reviews on some modern books would be cool. Potola equals clown. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I might do some book reviews soon. I, I, I might do a book review on um, uh, that book on the generations I've been talking about, you know, the... Um, uh, the fourth turning, I think that's. But that's but in in terms of economics, strictly, I, I don't know what would be the appropriate book in in this kind of category now. But you could imagine at one point, if you had had your channel at that time and everything, like Piketty's book. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Like it would have been maybe nice to really go full bore on uh, against some fashionable thing that's got everybody talking and just destroy it. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, on, on the book front, I probably am going to do the ultimate book list soon mm. at some point in the next few months, there's going to be two of them, one economics, one social and political theory. Mm. Um, so uh, look out for that. Yeah. yeah. And th there'll probably be two very long streams going through them as well. Um, <laughs> uh, Michael Kelly says there was a video I watched by a Marxist that stated the modern art market disproves capitalism because it disproves, because it disproves innate value you will find people assume you are operating under the same assumptions they are. Uh, how does the modern art market disprove capitalism? I don't know. Innate value. Uh, Austrians at least uh, talk about subjective value. That is, you know, exactly. if, if you think a rain dance uh, is going to make it rain and you pay somebody to do the rain dance, you, you think, you know, th that rain dance is valuable to you. The fact that it, the rain dance won't really make it rain is completely irrelevant from an economic in, in point fact, of view. In fact, it's the complete opposite. It's the Marxists yeah. who believe in an innate value. It's yeah. the Marxists who believe in, a, in objective value, and objective it's us who value. believe in the su subjective value. So right. I would yeah. I would say your Marxist, uh, the Marxist is confused. And, about, obje about object and you may know this, objectivists get hung up on this. They're like, well, we know that Mises was great and everything, but this subjective value thing, we feel this bothers us, you know? And I think it's literally almost a word. Like they just don't like that word, subjective value. I don't know that but, they really- the, the, modern art, like. the modern art market is an almost perfect illustration of, uh, yeah. is an almost perfect illustration of a uh, subjective value, I would say. Yeah, exactly. um, it, if anything, it goes against what the Marxists say. Yeah, here's, 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 a, here's some, you know, I mean, it's the it's your it's classic. Yeah, <laughs> here, here, here's the bed that Tracy Emin made. It took you five minutes. Oh well, I'm going to pay you a million quid. I'm going to pay eight million pounds for it because, right. I, you know, I'm Charles Sarchi or something. So um, anyway, Benjamin Rood says uh, MMT requires worms for brains. It's just exploiting the del delusional regime rather than smashing it. Its sophistication is irrelevant. Still, central planning fantasy economics yeah i mean it's, it's just utter garbage why i've i've resisted tackling it for as long as i have because i just think it's right. just it's just rubbish and you get into all this sophistry as well as we saw with uh, lord keynes's uh lord keynes's dispute disputation right where... but I, th I think it's right for you to eventually give in right because this is what happened with hayek and keynes um many people don't realize that keynes had already had a foray into uh macroeconomics in 1930. Um, and uh, Hayek got in, uh, wrote articles in the literature. I think he did a two-part journal article. That must be unusual. Uh, it was actually published in two parts across two editions of the journal and just absolutely destroyed Keynes's book. And so Keynes wrote another book and Hayek knew Keynes. They were friends, you know, and Hayek was like, you know, he'll, I'll destroy this book and he'll just do something else. So I just won't waste my time. Years later, he regretted it because the second book, The General Theory, you know, had really bad effects. Um, so it's like it's like you've said, AA, it, it, it feels like you being understanding economics means you just end up saying the obvious things over and over. But you mm -hmm. just kind of have to accept that, that that is part of the job, you know, yeah. <laughs> being a, someone who understands economics is you just have to keep restating things that to you seem really obvious and that you've already argued over over and over and over, and you just have to keep doing it. There's just, it never ends. You know? Try demasking the Keynesian lie by Javier Millel. I have um, not heard of that. That's interesting. That was Nico who says that. Uh, Benjamin Rood says, no grocer will hire an engineer. 
he knows as soon as the engineer can find the first job that uses his skills, he will leave. Um, he also says, not actually difference between Keynesians and Austrians, difference between imagining versus understanding. So I that's, uh, understand that comment. I can say that a friend of mine, I did not, I did the just wait until I get another job at one point, you know, I was between engineering jobs um, and I just waited. And a friend of mine said, I bag groceries, you know? <laughs> so I actually know someone who was an engineer who bagged groceries until he could get, get the next engineer job. I, I probably, I, pro I mean, I'm not an engineer, but if I, I'd probably like uh, just for good old times, go back to McDonald's for a while. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um I'm quite fond. I'm quite fond of menial work. Um, Austrian school Ubermensch says the main problem has always been epistemology. Um, yeah, I mean, underlying all of this is um, this idea. I mean, I don't want to. It's too late to get into it now. But uh, yes, essentially, the, the main problem is, you know, we're we're using praxeological reasoning to understand things using. Uh, mental mental constructions and isolating causal factors and reasoning that way, whereas um, they're under this delusion that um, you can somehow use um, either empirical uh, methods or even worse mathematical methods of of, mm. of discerning of discerning like economic laws, which which you, which you can't. Right. You, you, you've seen the absurdity it gets into with Lord Keynes, who's got this idea into his head that almost like price rigidity is like such a such a hard law that that it invalidates all other things you know it's just it's obviously you know obviously not true um but uh there it is he's got, he's got his evidence he's got his survey results right, uh, right. Ben, benjamin rude says um re italy salvini and others rigorously oppose this they want to generate their own bonds only no wonder the eu wanted him gone um, Ganji Bob Flankis says Isaac Arthur did a good video on future economics the other day. He suggests money comes from Dunbar's number. Money comes from Dunbar's number. That, uh, that's the idea. Don't get I, it. I, I don't get that. That's that's the. I do you remember I made that society based on Dunbar's number. You know the hellhole of uh, the hundred and fifty, the hundred and fifty villages. Mm -hmm. Do you remember? Because Dunbar's number is um, the, the idea that you can only know about 150 people. No. Oh. This is the, yeah. So I don't I don't know what that means. Um, Jedi Knight Anakin Cringe Walker says my fiance friend was freaking out at U.S. unfunded liabilities being at 144 trillion dollars. I don't know what unfunded liabilities are or how this affects our economy or debt. Well, I, know, I can tell you what an unfunded liability is, but Jack's going to tell us how it affects everything, right? So <laughs> unfunded liability is that the government has, in this case, the United States federal government, has um, promises out there, you know, that um, when you retire, this money will be available to you in Social Security payments. Um, there's... Uh, what do you call it when people retire from a government job? Pension. There's pensions that are promised. There's all these promises out there, right? But they don't actually have the money in the bank ready to pay off those promises. They're going to come up with that money later. That's that's the usual plan with the government. So those are unfunded liabilities. We have the liability. We owe somebody something or we have a promise out there, but we don't have the money to back it up. So where does that go, Jack? Thoughts? Well, if people want more information on this stuff, they can go to my channel. <laughs> Good, <laughs> because I got a video this week on this sort of stuff. So, excellent. Sorry to, it's uh, it's all come through. together, shilling and answers all in one. Uh, Benjamin Rude says, "Check out Kant uh, Bot's pseudo oxy pseudo pseudoxily podcast episode three. I'm going to give it a, a try. Pseudoxology. There we go." <laughs> and Alex Coglin says, Google the Bitcoin white paper AA and just read the intro. It's not long, but quite a brilliant idea, in my opinion. Shall I just... Uh... Yeah, this is the um, Satoshi uh, paper, right? So, well, yeah. Is that the whole, as I understand, the whole idea is that he basically just explained how, how, how Bitcoin should work. That was, that was the major contribution. 
is he just he he just had an insight as to how to have essentially um, you know artificial scarcity of uh, of something that could be like a money. Yes. Um. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I, it, the Bitcoin thing uh, makes perfect sense to me because you've got the restricted supply, right? So, it, of course, of course uh, there'll be value in it if you if you're disciplined enough. But uh, does anyone who controls that Bitcoin? Is it just a machine? Is it? No, 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 no. That, that's the whole point: is that it's decentralized. No one controls it. Very right? interesting. If someone controlled it, then the government could uh, could grab seize control, right? But there is no center to to uh, grab. I mean it, that that's one thing that started to happen before all this Corona stuff thing and before Brexit. Do you remember um, Mark Carney was starting to zero in on cryptocurrency, and they started saying, "Oh, beware of this crypto stuff." Mm. And now, even worse is uh, was it Facebook and Facebook are getting involved in it? So the, the corporates are going to try to launch their own to try to uh, try to compete with this. So good luck. Yeah, Inter so, uh, interesting. I'm still bitter about my. I've still got some ripple somewhere, and um, again, for some reason, my investment decisions never go well. Other than the gold I bought, I always I always end up losing. Um, I think I think you must do your investing choices from the same part of yourself where you do your voting, right? Yeah, I know. I'm <laughs> really bad at voting and investing. For some reason, <laughs> I always just make bad bets all the time. Um, so uh, maybe I should just only buy gold or something. Um, all right, mm. everyone. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, hopefully, I got uh, everybody at the moment. Well, Facebook, um, uh, YouTube has changed the way they do super chats, and um, it doesn't refresh immediately. So, if Ale Alex Cocklin was not the very last one, and somebody else has sent one in, uh, I apologize. I, I will. I will very likely miss it. Um, but thank you very much, uh, Jack. Anything upcoming on your channel people should look out for? Uh, tomorrow I have a stream and I have some stuff to do with bonds and other stuff like that coming uh, in the middle of the week. Although I'm not sure what day that video will be out because I haven't yet scripted it. But definitely I have a stream tomorrow. And uh, Radlib, when do you do your econ stream with uh, Mad Merck? Um, it's every other week, and we just had one, so it won't be for, you know, nearly two weeks. But um, and is is there a t day it's on typically? Or yeah, it's always Thursday in competition with uh, this week in history by the Britisher. My my hope, <laughs> my hope is I. But you know, I'm not going to compete with Cigar Stream. That's hopeless, right? Or or, <laughs> or unpopular opinion. So I had to. We had to find a time that worked for us that wasn't competing too badly. So hopefully, the people who are into the Britishers' history stuff are a different set of people than the people who are in the economics. <laughs> well, I, I I noticed that Harry N. Gladive tried to go head to head with uh, with uh, with Cigar Stream on Friday, and it didn't go that well for him. So, yeah. well, he he, uh, he got quite a few viewers, but it was because he got groped by Patreon. Yeah, because yeah, because because, uh, because because the British show was on there, right? And uh, all of that yeah. drama was going on. Uh, but um, yeah. I mean, you know, all these videos about cartels and the uh, price fixes and so on. But we do kind of run a bit of a cartel, don't we? We don't like I don't I don't run against um, Mark, for example, and uh, right. there's a few there's a few other people we check in with, so we make sure we don't run against each other. This right. is cartel. Right. This is cartel like behavior. But <laughs> Rat, Radlib is the true ANCAP has broken the cartel and is running against Britisher. Can you believe it? <laughs> it's nothing personal. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cheers, guys. All right, thanks.